Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Arby Shinholter. Arby, thanks for being here today. Thanks a lot, Jason. Appreciate it. Yes, Arby. First question, what do you like to do for fun? You know, for fun, believe it or not, man, I spend a lot of my time doing, uh, you know, trying to get out and learn new areas, trying to, you know, meet new people, anything social. I'm super extroverted. Uh, so, you know, I just like to, you know, drive around and see people, fall in with them, hang out. And I, I spend a lot of times reading, you know, trying to. What kind of stuff do you like to read? Read a lot of tech books, do a lot of, uh, you know, tech training, try to keep my skills up to date. I read a lot of science fiction fantasy for fun. I, you know, just anything I read, any books that make me better. You know, if you had to break it down, maybe, you know, 50% books to make me better, 50% books to make me laugh. And I try to read some stuff that puts me to sleep at night as well. So you like, you read a book a day or do you have a goal as far as reading or just read to whenever you feel like it? Yeah, I read when time permits. I probably read a book every couple of weeks. Okay. Every two. And you've always been a good reader, so to speak? Always. Always, since you're a little kid? Yep, since I was a little kid. Back when you had to read real books <laughs> and not, a, not digital screen. So do you think that's given you an advantage in your career? I think having that curiosity and, and having that willingness to learn something new, even though, you know, you may read a book that's not directly tied to what you're working with. You know, it can give you some, you know, you can learn some insights or learn some, some key phrases to guide you. So yeah, absolutely. So like, do you read like a book at a time and finish it and go to the next book? Or are you one of the people like read like three or four books at a time going back and forth? I usually read about three or four books at a time. Okay. And you know, if someone says a book that's interesting, I'll usually buy it or take it out of the library and, you know, and jump into it a little bit. And then I say, oh, I got to finish the one that I had before. Um, you know, I have a, a book in my work bag, a book in my personal bag, a book in my car type of thing. Hey, so. before we go, just cheers. Cheers. Pretty good, yeah. So this lady, I didn't even on podcast, um, man, I'm draining brain lock right now. I forgot to remember her name. I feel bad, but she has a, she's, she's from Britain. She has a, a company that's like called Twipes, like flushable wipes, right? And uh, she's actually from Barbados, which is where rum is from, right? So she's from the rum called from Barbados, yeah. I'm going to get some of that. Yeah, pretty good, yeah. It's really good. Yeah. Um. So um, what, what kind of, so we talk about what you do for fun. Do you do any hobbies you do for fun or any hobbies you do for like, you no know, work just to keep yourself going or like what kind of hobbies you do? You know, I, I do a lot of community involvement, right? And, and I know that it, it sounds like work, but, and it is work, but it, it sort of gives me that spiritual nourishment. Like it's like the equivalent of going for a walk in the park or going for a bike ride, right? I like to, you know, I like to, to like I said, interactions with people is important. Um, if I had, if you asked me a, a, a regular hobby, right? I'm trying to, trying to get my six pack back. So, <laughs> you know, hitting the gym more, um, you know, going out for jogs more, you know. Nice. So you're from Syracuse or Rochester, New York, right? Yeah. So, well, yeah. So I was born in Georgia. Okay. I'm Macon and raised in Syracuse. And then, uh, so I moved uh, to Ohio for about a year and a half and then joined the army. In it okay. Day. So me, like when I think of Syracuse, I think of Jim Brown playing football there, Donna McNair playing football, the Syracuse basketball team with the two, three zone defense and lots of snow. Like what should, what can you tell about Syracuse that most people don't realize? Good, bad, or indifferent? You know, so Syracuse one, I mean, I think a lot of people do know that it's the snowiest large city in the country. And, you know, it is really snowy there. But, you know, I think Syracuse is a beautiful place. Right. It's, you know, the, the fall in the Northeast is different than out here on the West Coast. Syracuse is hot as heck, too, sometimes. Right? It's not just always cold. It's just a beautiful place. And I think that, you know, you, you, you think of those older cities and you kind of get that rust. Well, it's not the rust belt, but you get that, that look of like these old cities. But it's just it's a, a gorgeous place. Beautiful. And how often do you go back? Never. Never. <laughs> <laughs> I never go back. Literally never. Nice. So, <laughs> so next, uh, one thing you're proud of is like being a girl dad. Can you talk about being a girl dad, what it means to you and the points of being a girl dad? You know, you know, being a girl dad is, is, is I'm very proud of it. You know, I was raised with all boys. Um, 
and you know, when you think about, I don't know, it's, it's funny because I, I look at how, you know, my friends who have sons, how they, you know, their approach oftentimes is a lot more um, learn these lessons. They build up just a little bit. Oh, yeah. A lot more learn these, you know, learn these lessons. And, you know, as a girl dad, I feel like, you know, it's, it's important to prepare her, she, you know, for me, right, to prepare her for life, good life, but also, you know, life's bad things, right? Like, and, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of is I'm able to connect with her in a way <clears throat> where, you know, we, we built, you know, she's 13 turning 14 soon. So, it's, you know, we've been able to build a relationship where she'll tell me things that she probably, you know, you know things that kids would normally be hesitant to tell their, their dad. You know, kids that I think are good kids who offer her drugs and stuff like that. Um, she's super smart. She's taken, you know, she has, she has the ability to, you know, taken a lot of information and, 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 you know, she's willing to do her work. She will, you know, loves to help out. I will say, <clears throat> you know, as we hear about, it's sort of stereotypical, it may be archetypical, because I think it really is true, you know, talking about the younger generation of the kids today and, you know, you know, you know, kids today are, are more into their devices, you know, digital relationships are more often than real relationships. Eye contact um, is not, you know, not like when we were kids, right? So, you know, I've been able to you know, work with her and, and, and train her up and it's become like natural to show that sort of have the, the old school um, in-person body language, body posture, eye contact, those things. And, but still, you know, she's, you know, she lives in a phone just like kids today. So, you know, it, being a girl dad is important because, you know, you have those elements of, hey, you got a date. And it's a little different when you got a daughter than when you have a son, I would assume. But yeah, that's, that's I saw this on, 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 on somewhere, right? It was like the difference between raising a boy and a, and a girl, right? So the dad, like, they were playing around. He's picking the son up, throwing him against the bed, you know, this like really rough housing. The girl, the girl's like, me too, daddy. He g gently picks her up, <laughs> gently lets her down, you know. But in reality, you should be doing the same thing to girls as a boy, right? Yeah, you should, right? And I so said, it's a lot of it is, you know, a lot of things you you don't have to deal with more often with a daughter than with a son, I would think. And like I said, I grew up with all boys. So, you know, we, you know, we experimented with the things that can hurt you. Um, you know, my daughter, she, you know, it's easier to, to not have to deal with her jumping off the roof. But, you know, it, it's different when, you know, she got the peer pressure of, you know, social interactions, social media is telling her how she should dress, what she should look like, you know, what size she should, she should be, you know, and this is, I mean, these things affect all kids, yeah. right? But just, you know, for, for mine, which is, you know, I, I spend the most time with obviously and have the most invested in, it's working through those issues, right? Self-esteeming her, right? Letting her know that, you know, what's important to her is what's important to her. What's important to other people oftentimes has nothing to do with you. Yeah. And, you know, the uh, most of, the interaction she has being that they're digital are not even real, no. right? People only show you their best side. Yep. And, and that's what, you know, we see in the community involvement as well. Right? You see that a lot of kids are heavily influenced by what they're seeing that's made up and fabricated in the social media. Yeah. And also too, like, you know, like for example, you, a boy will go through a mud puddle or he's just being a boy, mm -hmm. a girl, don't do that little Susie. You're going to, you're gonna you're gonna get dirty, you know. Don't do that, right? And it's like you're teaching like different values, right? Yeah, yeah. You know that. But I would, you know, I would tell her go in the mud puddle as long as you be ready to, you know, consequences, right? If yeah. you go in that mud puddle, there's a sharp rock in there that's gonna stab you in the yeah. bottom of the foot. Yeah. You know, go get stabbed, and then you'll learn not to go through mud puddles. Right? Yeah. But it, 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 but it's also, you know, kids today. You know, if you have a if you have a look like your worldview. And you can look around and you can see, you know, especially like in Seattle and, and, and cities, they're all big cities, right? You can see the, the, you know, a lot of people are affected by external things, drugs, homelessness or whatever. And, you know, I, I use the plight of others as sort of a cautionary tale to help, you know, my daughter to understand, hey, look, I, you, you, 
as I said, stepping on that rock in the mud puddle, it's a consequence. There's a consequence to everything. And, you know, also I get her involved with helping the community as well, right? Because I believe that, you know, serving the community is is one of the things that, and as you know. And, and she, if she like, dad, I don't want to do this. If you make me do this. Or she like, you know, already know the importance of it. Or do you have to kind of like pressure her to do it, so to speak? She fakes it with me, I'm sure. But she's typically, you know, she's typically very chill. She's also fairly extroverted, right? So she likes an opportunity to be around people as well. And it's something that we do together, right? Um, you know, our, our, our daddy-daughter time is oftentimes going to, you know, do something together to, you know, you know, I said work with some, work with kids or hit Panera. Um, she loves those desserts. Panera needs to use some stock as all I, you go to. I know, right? I know. And all of my gift cards, I was just looking through my gift cards. I got like three gift cards in my wallet right now because I never finish them. But I, I eat there so much. But that's what people give me. Yeah. So you've been on tech for like a long time, right? Maybe 10, 20 years. Yeah. So, so from a background perspective, um, heavy tech only for the last several years. Um, prior to that, you know, worked with products. Um, so, you know, I'm at Microsoft now, but when I was at Boeing, it was more uh, aviation services. And there's a, there's a tech component to it, but my, what I did was mostly around managing the offers that went out to customers and, you know, making sure that they were <laughs> valid, signed, executed, um, and such. Okay. So you might know the answer to this question. I'm going to throw it out there, Ray. And I'm kind of making this up, but the stats out there show like 80% of girls are interested in tech and STEM, right, in elementary school. Stats also show only 10% of girls are still interested during the 10th grade. So from 80 to 10%, like five, six years, why do you think it's such a drop off, right? It's society pressures. Girls don't do that. I mean, of course, it's hard, right? That's part of it, yeah, too. Exactly. I mean, it's, it is hard. Like, so you got to realize it's hard. Like, people drop out because it's fucking hard, right? Yeah. But that, but boys are not dropping off the same. Boys are staying. Of course, they drop off some, but they're still staying with the same range. Why do you think that is? Any ideas? I mean, that's interesting. But, I, you know, I would actually, that's really a great question. I, and I would think that when kids are younger, what they want to do is what somebody tells them they want, typically. You know, you tell your kid, hey, I want you to be a doctor. I want you to be a lawyer. I want you to be an engineer. Right? That's probably the, the top three. Um, and, you know, your, you know, kids will typically take that as, okay, this is what I want to be. It, it, it's funny, you know, I have to bring this conversation up uh, a little later. But, um, you know, back to your question, I think that once, once a kid really starts to see what's involved, right, I think if I was going to say, you know, that the, why girls don't participate as much as boys. I would probably say one peer group, right? If so, if you have a peer group um, of girls who are all on board, I would assume that they would all stay together and pursue that program together. Versus if you have, you know, a peer group and, and some may choose to, you know, pursue other careers. Um, because society's going to tell them, you know, typically, hey, you know, girls are nurses, girls are teachers, you know, that type of thing. And I also think that, you know, you know, schools to a degree, you know, they do a, they they do a lot of. I don't really know. I don't really, like you said. I don't really know the stats behind it, but I do think that um, a lot of its environment that would change girls. My yeah. and and, and at, yeah. in part, so a lot, a lot of percentage of all boys and girls probably drop out of that. Uh, it, it is it is hard, right? Yeah, it's hard. And then like how many parents are like or like superior groups? Yeah, that's yeah. that's too hard for you to do. I can't help you. you no, know, yeah. it's yep. You know it, it's and then you know if you look at you know when once it gets hard and once there's that you know if if your school has a program and I believe that schools play a pivotal role in preparing kids for um, these types of positions because they're, they're abstract. Right? Mm -hmm. I want to be in tech. What does that mean? Oh, I want to design web pages. I want to make pictures. I want to code. All right. But if your school doesn't show you what that actually looks like, gives you a try. And, you know, you, you think about it, the school either has to entice you, the school and parents, and I think parents are more important, yeah. which is what I do with my daughter, entice you or make you do it, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, kind of on a global scale, you see, you know, in other countries, a lot of times the kids really don't have a choice, right? There's, there's a competitiveness that makes 
you don't take the harder classes, if you don't do well in the harder classes, your future is not as bright as it would be if you would have. Yeah. But here we have a lot more choice. We have, you know, there's a lot more, um, you know, there's a lot more uh, options for kids to go out and do, you know, try art, try, you know, try art, try, you know, swimming, try, you know, but that those things are equally pushed in many cases, as long as you do your, your minimum of two math classes, you could go and spend the remainder of your you know, three years of school doing art or whatever, right? So what's your take on a parent is this? So you always hear everyone like, school needs art, school needs this, school needs that, but there's only so much time in the day, right? right? Until we make school eight to five, you know, 50 weeks a year is not enough time. So as a parent, how do you decide what you want the kids to teach the schools to teach their kids, right? And how do you balance that all the other, like some parents, my kid wants to do art, my kid wants to do, you know, whatever it is case, right? How do you think we'd go about that? You know, I, I think for me, once again, I, I try to tie it all to choice. Like I, I have a talk with my kid, uh, my daughter, and I say, hey, you know, you like, you know, what, what, what do you want to do when you grow up? And she'll throw out something. And it's usually, she's still at the stage where she says what's going to make me happy. I don't want to be an engineer. All right. I want to be a math or, or a math professional. All right. I want to be a physicist. And then I say, okay, you know, what I ask her to do is when, when we go through her classes, I'd be like, you know, if you, if you, you know, you got to have your math class, you might as well take a hard one, right? You might as well do your best in it. Um, when you get ready to go to university, right? I talked to her like it's definite. I said definite, right? And I know a lot of people say, "Oh, you know, university isn't for everyone," and uh, you know I respect that too. But you know, in my house, you know, we talk like you know, when you get ready to go to university, you need to be as prepared as possible. And if you and I let her know, if you choose certain degrees, right, as the data would suggest, you will typically have less of a chance of being unemployed after you're out of school, and you will typically be able to earn more. So if, you know, whatever you do from a, to reduce your risk in the future, do the hard stuff now. And then if you wanna, you know, if you wanna go and, and get an engineering degree and then be a, a nail tech after that, that's cool. Cause you always got something to fall back on. And I think, you know, for parents in general, right? Uh, it's critical that parents be involved in their kids' education. And it's critical for parents to have a say. Right? It's and it doesn't start in high school. You got to start before, and you know parents need to 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 help guide their kids towards you know, you know hey if you if you choose to go and become X, this is what you can expect from a you know a quality of life perspective and standard of living perspective. But if you if that's okay with you, then do it. You know. Yeah, that's one of my pet peeves. I might get slammed for this. Like you have all these young people, right? And to me, someone's lots of people failed them. Right? You got a young person. They'll go to this expensive liberal arts school, private school, end up paying hundred fifty thousand dollars in student loan debt, and they get a bachelor. We'll say, I don't know, art studies in the medieval times, mm -hmm. and they can, you know, like who's going to hire for that, right? I mean, and they have no internships, nothing, and then like, I just don't get it, right? Like to me, lots of people have failed them, you know. Yeah, uh, and I look at that from sort of a risk perspective. Right? Yeah, sure, you can, you know. In the right conditions, yeah, you can make that work. You can get you an art history degree and, 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 you know, you can leverage that and go to law school. Or, but if, if what you're looking for is, you have, you know, for me, and when I talk to kids, it's more of a fact-based approach rather than trying to make them feel good. You know, I think I saw this guy on Instagram. He said something that was so true. He said, all the people who tell you to follow your passion, they're already rich. They're already billionaires. Right? Hey, not to interrupt you. It kills me too. Like you have all these startup people, right? You know, don't work, work eight hours a day, have a work all day balance. I'm like, dude, your company's worth a billion dollars. Let's go back 15 years ago. What was that like? Yeah, were you like working 20 hours a week then? And, yep. and like you give this bullshit advice to people now, right? And there's a lot of bullshit advice out there because people want, I think a lot of times people want to make it sound like, hey, this is normal. I'm a normal guy. This is this is just what you got to do. All you got to do is, you know, and they leave out that just like social media, right? I only show you whenever I post a picture to social media, I take five of them and I post the best one, mm -hmm. right? And that's that's the image that people give of, you know, pictures they post of their experiences they share. 
you know, and with for kids, I think that a lot of kids are seeing this and, you know, just like get rich quick schemes, right? Like get rich quick. You, man, look how this is taken off. You know, Hey, you know what? I, I buy a, a, a Maserati or I buy a Lamborghini every yeah. month and I write it off and, and kids, you know, young people are yeah. just eating that stuff up and, and, and they don't even, you know, take the time to understand that one, it's false, but the details behind it, um, you know, no one's taking the time to tell them the ugly truth and the ugly side of it. Yeah. You know, I try to be that one who, as positively as possible, tells the, the flat truth. About this, right? Think, yeah, go look it up yourself. Go get the data, right? Go look up the IRS codes that say, hey, you can write off your Lamborghini. You show me that. Oh, if it weighs X pounds. Yeah, uh -huh. that's, that's not the same. No, no. So, so how about this, right? So I have um, some nieces and nephews that live in Dallas here, right? Mm -hmm. And you would think in this day and age, 2024, they will start teaching kids how to code like early as possible, right? Mm -hmm. And those coders, they don't start teaching them until ninth grade, right? Which is mm -hmm. way too fucking late, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, you think we can affect this, you think, or just, or do you think that says on the parents that, hey, this important skill for my kids I have, I need to take it on myself to teach my kids how to code? Well, I think, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of resources out there that can help kids code, but here's what I say. Look at the richest schools in the area and see what they're doing. Look and see when those kids start to code. And then you'll see, you know, and then look at the, the scoring systems that they have and look at the, how their kids do on the standardized tests. And then, you know, analyze what is that gap? What's the difference, right? And, you know, you, know, you, you would assume it's gonna be money, but it's not always money, right? A lot of times it's parental involvement. It's, it's support that the school gets from the community. It's support that schools get from corporations. And I think that that's usually a good indicator of when all schools should start to, and it will be younger. It will definitely be younger. Than that. So how about this? So we're both capitalists, right? So I don't believe in socialism, communism. However, saying that if you take like, I'll use, I'll use Dallas Texas example, right? Mm -hmm. There's a part, there's like South Lake Curve, right? Like homes a million dollars, a lot of rich people. Jerry Jones lives there, you know, property rates are really high. So a lot of money goes to school systems. And plus, most of parents there, they can afford to pay nannies, you know, be really involved, right? Where we'll say South Oak Cliff High School, most people are like single parents, low economic status, and the property rate's not the same, right? So those are, and then most of the parents like either, or I don't want to say uneducated, but they really can't have the kids out that much, you know, or they're working two, three jobs, so not involved, right? So then, but then obviously the, the kids of South Carolina have a, have a hell of an advantage, right, over these kids, right? Now, I don't agree. I don't think we should like, I don't know, like take property taxes from one district to give another one. But I have to be aware that balance this, make, you know, make it more even, so to speak, right? Yeah, no, and, and I, I totally agree, right? And I think a lot of that is you kind of got the obvious things, right? You got the, the parents who can, you know, commit the time to support. You got property taxes. You got those values. But I think the, the things that drive the better performance in rich schools is the parental expectations of the school, right? When, if, if you are in the rich neighborhood and you're, I'm sure there's a lot of highly educated, highly paid, highly entrepreneurial, high expectation having people in those areas, that rich area, they're not gonna let their kids just go and go to school and yeah, whatever happens, happens, right? They're, the very, they're very active. And, you know, it, it, you brought up a good point. Their, their parents have time to, you know, think of like the PTA, right? Um, but when you, you know, when you go to schools that are, you know, in lower income areas, a lot of times, even the parents who are ultra interested, one, they don't have the time to oftentimes to go up to the school and to drive, um, you know, that type of uh, performance from the school, but they also, try to influence the student more than they try to influence the school, right? Like if you can look, there's, there's data out there that suggests that kids whose parents are in a PTA do better. Now, does that mean, uh, you know, I've, I've seen the reports, I've read the data, um, but I haven't seen enough reports to have that be 100% conclusive, but there's enough data that shows the influence that a parent can have on a school. You go up there, you go up there when, you know, your kid get in trouble, you go up there and you go crazy. <laughs> and then you see like, yeah, I'm not saying that I'm not advocating for that, but I'm just saying 
a person who speaks up for their kid. Um, and, and you can also see that in a lot of these NGOs, right? A lot of the community organizations. When they work with kids, right? <clears throat> a lot of times it's also that influence that they have with the school. And, I, and I, all schools, I want love kids. And all schools want to support kids. But I think that it's just, you know, when you, when you have a priority that's based off of an expectation from somebody you don't want to upset versus, you know, a person who you may not care as much if you upset. Here's a question for you. I've asked, I don't ask this question to everyone, but a lot of people, I'm not sure what, you, what your answer is going to be. So let's suppose there's a group of people, that are economic power, right? They have all the jobs, all access to everything. And they, they want to help bring other people along, right? Another group, they're kind of like, you know, economic disadvantaged, they're having trouble getting jobs, they're like disadvantaged, right? So the people in economic power, is their responsibility to go down and bring those people up? Or if the people in economic advantage go and find these people in power and, 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 and get opportunities from them? Hmm. That's, a, that's a good question, but it's an interesting question. So I, so I think it from, from the perspective of equity, hmm. right? If, if you have a group of people in power, right, you have, you know, it, or is the reason why they're in power because their parents were rich and left them a bunch of money or did they work their way up? Um, they say they're it, it, all the above, we'll say. And so, well, in that case, if, if, the, if there's enough resources and for people who want to work their way up, because remember a lot of it's opportunity and luck, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it, when, when people make it, you know, for, you know, everybody, me, you, we, we've, uh, we've had certain experiences that prepared us to take advantage of opportunities, but that opportunity wasn't us who created it in many cases. It's an opportunity that someone else created. If you have a group of people who are disadvantaged, it, it, do those people have access to those opportunities? If those people don't have access to those opportunities, they'll never have the ability to work themselves up. So in that case, I think it would be the responsibility of the people who have the resources to, to help the people up. If the people, and, and that's what opportunity, right? Like that's, I'm not saying give them money, whatever yep. they, I'm saying. You it's like them. we have a network event, come to it, you know, yeah. let's meet some people. If you're looking for a job, doing yeah. developers, people hiring. Open the door, yeah. right? Open the door, give an opportunity. But at the same time, it's, you know, people who, you know, are, are less fortunate in that scenario, it's their responsibility to be ready to walk through that, right? It's their, to be ready to take advantage of the opportunity. And, you know, it, I, I think in our society, a lot of times we've, you know, we've moved away from, you know, concepts like, you know, personal responsibility. And, you know, we, we always assume that people want to be in the rich group or people want to be, and you don't, you know, we forget that some people are okay being where they are, right? And some people they're, are- They're comfortable, right? They're comfortable, yeah. And, and I think that we need to move away from trying to put, you know, a value that may not exist on a person, on a person. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I definitely agree, right? Because like, you know, you're the disadvantaged group and someone says, hey, if you, if you come to this networking group, I can probably get you hired. A lot of times they'll be like, well, um, that's too far. The, the, I can take the bus, then I have to walk half a mile. I mean, you have to make some kind of effort, right? And, and yeah, and then, like I said, that's in, in any situation. I took this labor economics course, and it was funny. And they actually have, you know, there's a curve that shows how much people who have no job. So I say a people who, who's on public assistance, a person who's on welfare. There's a price that that person would require to, to take a job. And a lot of times it's valid, right? If I have two kids and I'm not working, then childcare is X dollars. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna need X dollars plus yeah, you're right, to yeah. take a job. So, you know, it, it's understandable. Um, and like I said, a lot of times we as a society, we don't really look at a person's real situation. Right? We look at just outside and say, oh, you know, you, you know, you're this, that, or the other, you're lazy or whatever. But a lot of times people have um, issues that you know, require them to take more money in order to just get a job. But that being said, you are very right when you say, hey, look, you know, here's a job for you. And then people are like, oh, you know, I'm all right. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I like sleeping in all day. Yeah. I, I don't like the requirements. I don't like that. You know, I, I, I talked to this homeless gentleman and um, 
I said, you know, why, why do you live on the streets? And I was like, there's, you know, there's a housing place for you right here. And his answer was, because I like to drink. He was like, I can't drink if I'm in there. It's worth it for me to sleep outside. I was like, all right, right? Yeah, perfect yeah. example. I, I thought to talk about this in my pocket before. So I don't know if you walked up. Did you notice this black guy sitting in front of the post yeah. office? Yeah, he's over there now. Yeah, so like, I have no idea if it's true, but three or four people in the building has told me this, right? Suppose he's been there for 12 years from the post office, right? They think he has dementia. People try to like help him. He doesn't go anywhere. He's there all the time. And suppose like three or four years ago, a young lady came and took him away, right? Mm -hmm. And they guess his daughter, granddaughter, something. No one knows. And he was back like six months later. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, people, I mean, people like what they like. Like I said, once again, you know, we, we, we tend to put our own, you know, preferences and sensibilities and, you know, what we like on other people. But, you know, a lot of people, you know, are very aware that their situation wouldn't be ideal for everyone. Yeah. But, you know, there's a certain freedom to it. Yeah. You know? So here's a question for you. And I'll give my answer first for your answer, right? If you go back in time, what would you want to learn? Like for me, I don't want to learn like public speaking better, sales, coding, and physics. If I go go back to like my high school years, I don't want to coding, physics, public speaking, and sales. What, what would you want to learn if you go back in time and do it again? Well, yeah, I would probably, you know, it's always, you know, everything's like that, you know. Public speaking, I, I don't mind so much, but I would like to be like a Barack Obama level public speaker, yeah. right? Um, I would like to have gone further in math too, right? So one of my people who I just love watching and following, Neil deGrasse Tyson, right? And, you know, he dumbs down astrophysics in a way that I can understand it. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm decent in math, but... You know, once you really, you know, dig into what, you know, some of those those more advanced concepts, you know, everybody's lost. You know? And I would like to know, like, super, super, super high level. So next, um, talk about your time, like, as being a, a military veteran, like, what made you decide to go in the, in the Army? What what you got out of it? And how has being a veteran is helping you with your career now? So, yeah, so military family. Um, and you know, what made me go in, I always felt like I was going to go into the military. Uh, and like I said, it was, you know, it, it, in the nineties, there wasn't really as much, um, you know, it wasn't really as much, I don't want to say, I don't know. I don't know how to say it. It seemed like there wasn't as much choice, right? Like, you know, go to the army or go this, like, it was like that. Um, and so, you know, going in. You know, I learned a lot. I was super shy when I went in. I was, you know, I didn't understand how to lead. I didn't understand how to follow, you know, how to fully support. Um, and then, you know, when, you, when you're in there, you know how it is, man. It's, you know, they, they tear you down, but they teach you stuff. They teach you stuff you didn't know. Um, you learn adaptability. Uh, and that's, you know, some of what's helped, like, like how the military helped me. One is, you know, to be comfortable in situations where I don't know what's going on, right? And to know that I'm not the only one in the room that doesn't know. Um, how to be a team player. You know, one of the things, one of the lessons we used to always have, and I know that anybody who's been in the military has it is, the work's not done until everybody's done. So if you finish, you don't stop. You go help everybody else, right? And like that type of life lesson right there, if you put that in the context of, of career, Right. What it looks like is you're a hyper helpful help person. Right. And when in a in a a lot of jobs, in a lot of places, everybody is concentrated on getting ahead. Right. And they're not really looking at helping their, you know, helping their other their their coworkers. Um, and I think that, you know, the military definitely prepped, you know, me and to to do that automatically, right? And muscle memory, like everything else is muscle memory. Um I also think, you know, when, when you get, deal with news, deal with bad news, deal with good news, deal with situations, um, you know, emotional situations, you can put that emotion aside for a minute and make a decision, you know, take that second to think um, and, you know, just realize that you still got to get things done no matter how you feel about it. And I think that like, those are, those are a couple of the big lessons, but, you know, they come across as teamwork, they come across as, you know, being a, you know, a, a compassionate leader, looking out for your folks and looking out for folks. Yeah. One thing I think the military, especially army does not get no credit for is how diverse the army is. Right. Oh, yeah. Like I work oh, people yeah. all across the nation, different demographics, different genders. I mean, 
all across the board. I think the military doesn't get enough credit for that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We used to, we used to always have, you know, different days where, you know, it'd be hip hop one day, yeah. listen to it, and rock music one day, and mm -hmm. country music one day. Now I tell you, I, I got some of the most, and I bet yours are the same, the most diverse music taste and yeah. music knowledge um, of, of, of anybody, because you know, and you've heard these songs, and the, you also get an appreciation. Yeah, and the different foods and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. different culture, you know, like different holidays, so to speak, yeah, you know. Absolutely. And you know, it also, it, it also teaches you as well, right? Like when you see people get so upset and wrapped around the axle about things like politics. Right? Yeah, like you're kidding especially, me right now? Yeah, ex you know, like, especially when things are polarized along, you know, lines that they uh, typically are, are racial to a, to a degree, right? You know, politics especially. It, it helps you to be like, yeah. do you? You can't tell me one thing this guy's done, and you can't tell me one thing this guy hasn't done. Yeah, right? exactly. Like you know, and, okay, you say you're not gonna vote for X. Well, yeah. can you tell me why you're gonna vote for Y? Exactly. And then at the end of the day, I don't really care who you vote for because it's your vote, yeah. right? And we're still friends. And because you know what, I had a friend who you know in the military who was, man, you know, one of my closest friends from Sylacauga, Alabama, right? And and you know what I mean? And this dude, man, we shared stories. And you say, hey, man, if, if you got my back, I got your yep. back, it's, then the rest of this is all fabric. Yeah. It's so, so this is my story. So I started basic training, and this black guy from the Bronx mm -hmm. had never seen a white dude in his life. A white dude from somewhere in Kentucky a black dude. And they're both like, the white guy says, I don't like black people, but like, I don't like white people. Of course, the dress songs put them together, right? Yep. But you fought whatever. At the end of eight weeks, basic training is graduate ceremony. And like, you have like, dinners, right? And the two people, white and black, I said, well, what are you doing to do with family? The family like, we're not eating with them. Both kids were like, if you don't eat with us, then you're not going to eat with us, right? We're eating together, right? And the family's like, you know, we likely sat down, right? But then they had dinner and stuff. Like, so many stories like that in the military. Yeah, and it's, you know, we had, uh, we had basically, it was a joke. Like, like racism sort of became a joke to a degree, right? And, you know, it, it, and if there's racism, and it, even you now you see it, right? It's like, hey, man. You know, I I like this person, and, and black people are this, and oh, you're military. Oh, it's, no, you're you're okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you know how it is, yeah. and it, it's funny because you'd be like, man, dude, there's so much other stuff for us all to worry about. There is right, and the military, you know, that's what they teach you, right? I'm not gonna, I don't have time to worry about whether you drove a pickup truck or yeah. whether I, what I drove when we both getting our asses chewed out, we we pushing the concrete and sweating all over the place or dying together. It could be anything, right? Yeah. Like, Shared pain, so to speak, right? Yeah. You're yeah. in Afghanistan with all your stuff yeah. on 100 yeah. degrees and you're burning the fuck up. Yeah. And so you, it's, it's bigger than that. Right? Everything is elevated higher than, than the, 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 these little reference things. Yeah. So talk about this. Another thing the military does good, I, I don't think they get credit for, like, everyone has to stand up regardless of your rank, E1, E3, E4. You have to get up with a group of people and give a class and speak, right? You got to, like, if you're, if you're like a, I don't know, Pumping fuel, you have to get up and give a class how to pump fuel. Everyone gets up. Everybody. I don't care what your rank is. Mm -hmm. Lowly, private, or general, you got to be able to get in front of people and public speak. I don't think we, the army is no credit for that either. Nope. And, it, and it's funny because in that environment, you know, you you, you learn that. It, it, you know you got to do it, and you watch other people who are also getting um, getting that same nervous experience. But after a while, everybody gets good. And then it becomes about, not about actually getting up to give the class is making sure you give the class right. It's, yeah. you know, and I, absolutely. The military does a great job of that. Military, I, I think, does a great job of, you know, you, you hear people say, oh, I learned my discipline in the military, which you do. Um, but it's those things uh, that you also learn and you get the chance to break stuff and you get the chance to, you know, what I mean, like it's like if you, if you know, if you look at a lot of, you know, people, grown ups or kids today and you say, hey, I know you've never done this, but I need you to go do it and you need to have it done in 15 minutes. Yeah. You know, even if it's something that's relatively minor, right? People will have that that yeah. you know that 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 sense of panic a lot of times. And I think the military, you get so used to that that now, you know, when I got to go and figure something out, you know, at work or whatever it is, you know, is it's just what it is. Yeah. And you know, and I think also that, that I go back to the teamwork aspect and the support aspect, 
right? It's the if I'm gonna ask you to do something, it, it was one is gonna be something that I I would definitely do it myself, but I'm gonna make sure you're prepared to. Yeah. And you know, a friend of mine, you know, his leadership style is it's definitely not based on anything military, very autocratic. Yeah. And he likens himself to, oh, if I was in the military, I'm I was like, no, you'd fucking fail. Yeah, you fucking, you'd, you'd get your ass. You wouldn't have made it, right? You would not have made it because it's it's a we, right? But it's that's another a... thing about the military. People think the military is do as I say, or like, oh, there's some leaders like that, but every leader I know was like, do as I say, they fail quickly, right? Yep. Other people shut down. The like successful leaders are like, like, hey, how do you want to do this? Yep. What do you think about this, you know? And then the ones who do are do as I say, they've earned the right to say do as I yeah. say, right? You know, they've already been, you know, they've already proven that they are one of you, right? Like, yeah. And, uh, you know, I tell my friend that I was just talking about that. It's like, hey, man, it's not like you think, right? It is definitely not, oh, I, uh, you know, I'm a captain, I'm a major, go and do this. It's definitely not that, right? Yeah. It's, it's, hey, man, you know, hey, we got to get the shit done. Like, what do we need to get this so done? So here's a good story. So I was, I was a list of 400 Texas. I belong to aviation here, right? And so you, you, you remember NTC, right? Oh, yeah. So some, some way with NTC, like four times in seven months, right? Fucking fucking crazy, right? And so the first three times we were like the same group of leadership, right? They're all left new leaders came in, right? And so they had us practice set up tents, right? And they had like a stopwatches on us, right? Mm -hmm. And since it's not fast enough, we looked at us so like, we're done. Like, we, we, I mean, we we did a minimum from then on, right? Like, yeah, muffle, we did this three times already. You knew you're going to fucking put a stopwatch on us. Like, we done broke our record on the kind of shit. Like, get the fuck out of here, right? Yeah. That, that that issue did not last long. Yep. You, you, I remember one time um, we had an NCO, a, he's an E6, and we had a, a lieutenant. He'll probably watch this, too. It'll be funny. But I remember he had this, the butter bar, a uh, um, second lieutenant who came in with, with that, you know, all about blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I remember he told him, he said, uh, the NCO, the sergeant, he said, he's like, oh, sir. He was like, what? He's like, your breath smells like the colonel's ass, right? <laughs> and then, so Lieutenant, he don't really understand how things work yet. So he go, makes a big stink about it. He tells the colonel, and that colonel just cracking up laughing, man. Yeah. And he's like, yo, well, then you better start listening to the person who know, yeah. right? Like, he knows. You don't know. Yeah. And so your little four-year degree doesn't prepare you, right? Yeah. It takes more than that. So it, it was interesting. And there's a lot, you know, tons of stories. Yeah, definitely. So... Yeah. Next, let's talk about, so we're both veterans. Let's talk about veteran business, right? You can actually, you can feel like, you know, blank business, right? You can, any Democrat fill it in, right? So there's a lot of veteran business out there and they'll start a business, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And they'll tell other veterans, hey, come support my veteran business, right? Mm -hmm. And you're the first time like, man, this is like kind of trash, right? But okay, I help my guy out. Go the second time, man, this ain't much better, right? What's going on? Third time you go, damn, this guy is fucked up, right? And then you stop going and then the veteran business owner that complains like, Veterans don't support me. I'm like, dude, you got three chances. You should have trash. And I think there's so many businesses, like blank demographic business, where like they expect to support the community, right? Mm -hmm. But the the business straight out sucks, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you is there a way to fix that? Or like, like, is this yeah. Yeah, I think I think a lot of times, especially if you have, you know, veterans or like you said, any other demographic, right? I think if you have a business and you have a person who's supporting you, not because you're the best option, but because of some connection that they have to you. First of all, you should always make sure they are taken care of, right? They, that they get the best you have. Um, and it's still, it's win-win, right? You should definitely make it win-win. Uh, and, you know, I think you, you should also be able to take that feedback, right? If you have a person, especially if you're a veteran, you know, I mean, we've all had to go through the inspections where you have to make sure your draw underwear are folded six inches, whatever, all that shit. Then you should be able to know that your business needs to operate, you know, with, with high impact and effectiveness. And if you if you don't, then you need to be able to take that feedback and work that into your processes to make sure that you are at least if you know you have a like I said a high demanding client. Even if it's your if it's your friend, if it's a veteran, if it's you know if it's you know, the president of the United States, your shit should always be tight, at least close to tight, right? As close as you can make it, right? Like we all, there's a lot of things we all don't know. But if I know if something's bad, there's typically some things I can do to improve it, right? And if you want to put a product or a service out on the market, your shit should be good. At least it should be, you know, depending on if you're, 
no matter it should be the best quality you can provide right if, if you're if you're charging a lot for it it better be damn good that's my horror story so there's a veteran restaurant down south it's, it's been closed like five six years right mm -hmm. so i went there one time it's like the orange juice obviously was diluted with the water wasn't any like god damn dude like shit got one napkin <laughs> Go use the bathroom. There's no paper towels, no soap. You know, it's like, dude, what are you doing, man? You know, he, and he needs to be. Well, he probably knew that was fucked. Yeah, exactly. he's out of business. Yeah, but you know, you think about it. Take it back to, you know, Point Rustin in uh, Tacoma, mm -hmm. right there. I like going down there. I like the the. the it's a nice you know, place. Beautiful place. Right? But there's a guy who sells honey there. I personally am not a honey person, but I buy honey from that guy every time I see him. Why? Because we have a, you know, he gives a 10% uh, discount for veterans, yeah. which doesn't matter because I'm buying honey I don't need anyhow. Mm -hmm. But it's just the connection that you have and the quality that he makes. And he, you know, it's it's the respect. It's the, the, the customer service. It's his product, right? Like I said, I don't really, honey's honey to me. Yeah. Let's just put it that way. Like he got wildflower. Honey's so good. Be something, this, that. I don't know shit. It's just all the same, right? Like, I just want some <laughs> generic Walmart honey. <laughs> Give me some Costco honey. But, but you know, that experience, it, it, yeah, was it good. counts a lot. And, and I think that if you have a, if you have a, a business that you're supporting because of a connection that's not related to that product, you, the business owner is responsible for creating that experience every time. You know, I think, especially with people who are supporting you when they don't have it. Yeah. Speaking of support, on the other hand, right, you got these people out there, hey, small business owner, give me a discount. Give me this, give me that. Like. Mm -hmm. You're not asking fucking Taylor Swift for discount on tickets. Exactly. You're not asking Tom Ford for discount on the purse you're buying, right? But you want discounts from this guy who's struggling and actually doing good business exactly. with every cent counts, right? And then, you know, that's interesting. Yeah, that is an interesting phenomenon that you see, right? People hey, do, hey, homie. Hey, yeah, homie hookup. Hey, man, let me, hey, you know, like I said, if, if, it's, uh, if, it, if it's a connection that brought you in, mm. then it's, you know, it's an incremental sale in that case, yeah. right? If I'm selling bottles of water, and you ain't, th you're not thirsty, but you're buying this because you like my greenish, whatever color shirt, yeah. then I'm going to give you my best price on it because I had to do nothing for the sale. Yeah. But yeah, in those cases, if I'm doing some real work for you that takes some real time, I, you, know, you got to respect that. Help me out. Yeah. You know? So in Russian Way, do you know where the Ferrellis is at in Russian Way? I've seen it. I've never been in it. Have, have you been in that area before? Uh, that's where, yeah, it's like near six, right? Yeah. Have you ever, have you ever been to the ice cream place there? I've walked around there, but I don't know. So every time I go there, the line is like at least 50 people long, right? I've seen the line. I'm like, man, these people are waiting this line this long. This, you know, I've, I've been a couple times. I used to be really good, right? Because it's just a great place. But man, that's like an example of having a good experience, right? Like you, you're going to wait at least 30 minutes in line to get the ice cream cone, right? Like mm -hmm. how, how, like how good of a business is that, right? Exactly. Exactly. And you know, it's, you know, from a business perspective, I think people take what they think is good. And that's the standard versus yeah. what the customer thinks. Yeah. Is, right. And I think that, you know, you should, I'm very simple, right? Fancy food, I, you know, it, you know I, I went to this one place and it's super famous. They make ice cream in South Seattle. And like the salted caramel stuff, it tastes like tobacco to me. And yeah. I was like, I know it's me because I see all these people loving it. Yeah. So it's like, all right, well, maybe they should make a version that, you know, I don't know. Now they probably don't care about me because there's a million people yeah. waiting in line. But like I said, it's you know, I'm sure they've taken that feedback, and I'm sure somebody said, "Hey, it tastes like tobacco." Because it's, yeah. yeah, it's like that old spaghetti factory spumoni, man. It tastes like tobacco to me. I don't yeah. know why. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think people need to take feedback and, and don't and understand that the product that they're offering may be fantastic to them, but you're not the customer. You're not the customer. Moving forward, this is going to be a personal story on your part, right? So tell us, Terry, about how you was at Boeing and those layoffs going on. They offer you a position as a janitor. Talk about that real fast. So, yeah, man. So I, when I was at Boeing, I started in a factory. And, you know, you know I, I, I can do some patting on the back here, but, like, it was that, you know, I just did what I had to do. Um, you know, fresh out of the military. So, man, like, you guys are going to pay me to work on a Saturday or Sunday? All right, I'll do whatever you want. So when – um when the, there was a layoff and it was in the IAM union, so it's it's by it's seniority, right? And so when you know my number came up on the layoffs, you know they said, hey, you know, you know, you're out of here, 
but hey, if you're interested, right, we can, you know, you can go and you can become a janitor. And I said, you know, what well, a factory service attendant. I was like, all right, but whatever. Like I said, you know, it's, it's a different, um, you know, that adaptability from the military time uh, it just put me in. I, I, you know, got my papers and I went and reported as a, a janitor and, and still one of some of my fondest memories of ever working were doing janitorial work, right? And it was, a, it was an awesome opportunity. Um, they didn't even take any money. They paid me the same amount. And I could still work overtime on the weekends to support the factory in some situations. Um, so I loved it. And, you know, it gave me an opportunity to take classes. It gave me an opportunity to just you know, clean up building. They would say, hey, you know, clean this building. You got a month to clean all these floors. And, and you know, I was high speed, low drag. So, you know, I cleaned it in whatever. And so talk about the attitude. I think most people are like, I'm not being no fucking janitor. That's below me. Yeah. Talk about being humble enough, having like, like the lesser ego, like do something like that. Because most people are like, I ain't doing no fucking job. I should do this. That's that's beneath me, right? Talk yeah. about that attitude you had. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people, are, like a lot of people are, you know, oh, no, I'm not cleaning up bathrooms. What are you talking about? And me, man, I, my gro the grossest thing for me on earth, right, is, you know, that um, snuff. What do you call it? Like the, the uh, Col Col Claymore. What is uh, Copenhagen. Copenhagen, right? Yeah. Copenhagen, right? Spitting it in cups and shit. Ugh, that's the worst thing. That is the nastiest thing ever to be. So when they told me to become a janitor, I was like, all right. But I'm like, damn, that means people, because this is in the 90s, right? So people are still spitting Copenhagen out. And so I was like, Ugh. but, you know, man, it's, you know, at the end of the day, right? You, if you have a, you're at a company you like, you're at a company you believe in, you know this is likely temporary. Letting your ego make a decision for you is definitely not the right thing. Right? And I think that, you know, for me, you know, in the military, man, we've all, how many toilets have we cleaned? How many, you know, and then, you know, other times, how many, how many times have you know, Fred puked in your car? And, you know, we've cleaned up some yeah. gross shit, right? So, you know, you guys are, I'm getting paid to clean a bathroom. And I always thought it was pretty cool, too, because they always gave you the best shit to clean up, right? And I, it was no longer Simple Green and an old-ass mop. And, you know, they, you had some high-tech stuff and personal protective equipment that was, you know, incredible. So, yeah. And then how do you like, how do you transition from like being a janitor at Boeing to that intend to really start your tech career? You all talked so, about the opportunities I gave you. You know, it's funny, man. So initially, so like I said, it, you know, gaining some education um, and it just being a kind person, right? Like being a kind person makes Cause, sure. Because I'm sure if you've been a jackass or jerky boy, they would never offer the opportunity to stay on as a janitor. Like you, you had probably had plenty of personality got along with people. Like, hey, Arby's a good guy. Let's let's try to take care of him, right? People look out. Yeah, people look out for people who they like, right? Um, and you know, I you know, it, I think that being able to, you know, one have a good attitude about things, right? The good attitude about becoming a janitor is one, but prior to that, it was the good attitude for about having to climb in the wing or having to climb on the wing or having to sweep the floor or, Hey, you know, I know you're supposed to get off right now, but can you help out? You know, it's, it's all that, you know, the previous goodwill that's built up that culminates into an opportunity, right? As a janitor, right? So like I said, taking classes, trying to do my best, but it was actually, uh, there was a guy who um, he's on LinkedIn to shout out. Um, but you know, he's, he would, so I would be there on second shift and cleaning the bathrooms, vacuuming the floors, dumping the trash can. And he'd always be like, Hey man, you know, um, you know, do you, you know, you, you, you work late. I'm like, no, man, I don't start till two o'clock type of thing. Right. And so we would just talk and it was always a pleasant conversation. And then, you know, one day, you know, ironically, and the reason I don't say his name is, um, you know, he's the person who, he was a lot sh more strict than a lot of other managers. And he's like, you know, what are your plans? And I said, man, I don't know. You know I'm just trying to go wherever I end up going. So, uh, but, you know, trying to always progress. And then he said, well, hey, I have an opening on my team. And it was in change management. Um, and, you know, he was like, you know, how, you know, how do, how do you deal with change? You know, I adapt and overcome. You know, <laughs> throw that military shit out there. He loved it. 
And, uh, but, you know, he, he gave me an opportunity, right? And, you know, this is the time, like this is in, the, you know, 2000 when, you know, tech is really taken off, computers are taken off, um, you know, PowerPoint and all these other projects, all these other products are coming out uh, to the, into the business uh, arena. And, you know, a lot of my coworkers, they didn't want to, you know, they, 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 you know, they didn't want to learn it. Basically. And so he would send me to classes. And he would, you know, send me to, to learn new stuff and then come back and sort of train the trainer. Um, you know, some of the, one of the skills that you learn at Boeing is sort of that, you know, that, that program management ability and that ability to, you know, drive projects and get, you know, get stuff done to a degree, right? Like, and, and still be able to say, what did it take to get it done to document a process properly? These are things I learned from him. Um, and like learning, you know, him and his organization and also like, you know, how to take real feedback. You know, I remember one time when uh, I had worked on his presentation, this is the old days. I'd worked on his presentation. I did my best. It was beautiful. And then uh, when I delivered it, he's like, Aubrey, it's obvious you didn't put any time into this, you know. You're like, what the fuck? I, I said 10 hours <laughs> on this shit. <laughs> but you know what? A little bit of hurt. But, you know, I said, all right, man. Hey, you got to pay me to do it again? You pay me to do it? You got to pay me to do it again? I don't care, right? Like, let me just go do it because, right, it's from a quality perspective. It was important to get it right. But also, you know, back to I thought it, I thought it was good, right? But that doesn't mean my customer hey, thought it, it was up, good. Like, right here. You're right? Like, no, but like, grab them, have mine, like, like that. Like more even to the table like this, so it won't fall off. Oh, okay. Yeah, like that. Um, so I asked this later on, but since you brought it up, who who are some of your mentors right now? So my mentors, so I got Barbara Phillips. Um, you know, she's I'm gonna scoop a little bit more. Okay. So I got you know, right Yeah, like that. There we go. Let me see. Okay. So so Barbara Phillips. Um, she's one of my mentors. Yeah, you know her. She's the executive director of Community Network Council. Yeah, we're gonna definitely do a deep dive on that later on. Oh, right, right. She's a mentor. You know, she's you know good spirit, good leader. Um, holds me accountable. You know? Yes, she does. Yeah, she definitely does. Um, but supportive, takes care of me. You know, and like I said, if you've been doing something for a long time, you know, you assume that you know your crap, right? You assume. That, but you can always get better, right? But you can always get better, right? And a lot of times we forget that, right? A lot of times we forget that. Um, I have another mentor who also on LinkedIn is named Mike. And uh, you ready for another drink? You start drinking drinking yours. Yes. You want to sip too? Want some more of that? Okay. Yes, I'm good. So, you know, and Mike is, you know, when I when I have a problem that I can't, uh, you want to cut the rest of it out. When I have a problem that I can't figure out right which happens quite often because like i said you know i i think that when you're when you're trying to be you know a professional a lot of times you can think you know stuff because you've been doing it for a long time but your way is is not always the right way for instance um i'm a very democratic type pm or leader right? like I, I like to get everybody's buy-in um, before I do something. And then sometimes, you know, there's, you know, there's the voices of dissent or there's the people who want to do something differently. And, <clears throat> you know, sometimes, you, you know, there's a delicacy that you need in dealing with that to, to, I mean, yeah, we always got the way, just use the hammer to, mm -hmm. but nobody likes it. Yeah. So, you know, trying to find that delicacy is, you know, I like to talk to him about some of the stuff that I do. And I have so a lot of my leaders at um, Microsoft as well, right? I run things by them. I don't, you know, it's, it's a it's a culture change, right? Like when you think of tech, or you think about being a PM, when you think about product management, when you think about these are all terms that we throw out, but underneath those terms, there are a million, a, a gajillion, if that number is real, different ways that can manifest, right? Like tech could mean one thing in one situation, another situation, uh, PM, product, all of that. So a lot of times, you know, there, there's there's a lot of methods that I don't know. Um, you know, one of the things people ask quite often is shifting from Boeing to Microsoft. There's a huge culture change. I can I mean, imagine. A huge I culture can imagine. change. Um, 
and there's also, you know, a huge tools difference and a huge, you know, just the way, you know, your, the nimbleness, the agility, the bureaucracy, the, the administration, like all, everything is different. So I, I reach out to a lot of people to help me understand and navigate as I need. And, oh, that's another thing the military taught me too, right? Just reach out for help. You know, if you, if you're doing quality work and you're trying to do quality work, people will always help you. And then who you're mentoring? Because I know recently, I don't know if you've seen it, but this young man who just graduated college gave you a shout out as being your being one of your, yeah. being a mentor for him. I can't remember his name, but yeah, Michael. Okay, yeah. yeah. Who yeah. are you? Who, who you're mentoring? So I mentor. So formal. So you you know if you think formal mentoring and informal mentoring. So he's a formal mentor. So I mentor for University of Washington Foster School of Business. And you know, Michael, I I, I tend to like to mentor students who um, who may have come up, you know. You know, people who, who've had some experience. And, and, you know, Michael's a super, super smart young man. Um, he works at Boeing in cybersecurity. And, you know, we talk about stuff and, you know, we have, you know, fantastic. He, he reminds me of like some of the stuff that I dealt with. And I remember like, you know, the, the trouble I had navigating some of the issues that he had being newer in career, right? Like, you know, some of the things that, you know, were important to me then and, you know, so I learn as much from him and I tell him this all the time. I learn as much from him as he learns from me. And I have other mentees, um, you know, people and, you know, we uh, we talk, you know, quite often. But, you know, those are more formal and, and informal. Right? Informal, I mentor anybody who wants to talk. Right? Any, if I see a young person or if I see a person who is um, a, a person who needs something that I may know, uh, you ever see that movie? Um, what's the one with uh, the sniper, the best sniper in the world? Uh, Kyle, Chris Kyle. Oh, the, the movie though. I know you're talking about yeah. American sniper. Right? Yeah, I think so. Um, remember when he was talking to the guys? I'd never actually watched the whole movie, but when he was talking to the guys and he says, "Hey, you're 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 this. You're like Delta," and he says, well, "I know a few things that might help keep you alive, right? Like if if I see an opportunity to share something that'll save some trouble for someone." you know, I share it. Right. And, you know, I live by the worth of example, right? Like, yeah. it's, you know, it's, if you say, Hey man, you could do it that way. What do they used to tell us in the military? Right. Do it the way I ask you to do it one time. And if you got a better way to do it, yeah. you tell me, you better tell me the better yeah, way. You better tell me. And so I tend to, you know, I try to, and, you know, I said that feeds into my personality. Right. Too. Like, I, I like to talk. I like to show people. I like to learn. I like to, to teach. So, um, so what's your take on this back to like the your janitor time and I take opportunity, right? And I might get slammed on this, but I don't care. I think too many people nowadays, regardless of age or experience, they want $500 an hour, but they have a $5 an hour work ethic. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's a lot of that. Right. And, and I said, once again, it's, remember what I was saying, right? You, you know, people think that a product, the product that they think is the best, but it, your customers may not think that your product is the best. In this case, people are in a product, right? People, you know, you you know, people, you see these phrases, know your worth, and you see these phrases, and people are like, oh, you know, I'm worth more than that. Yeah, but are you? But are you? Are right? you, yeah. And, and how Can do you, you know? It? Yeah, how do you know? Because in actuality, typically, we're only, I mean, if you look at it in the business world, and if you take away all of the, the people-centric, positive, you know, messaging, you're only worth what it costs to replace you. Yeah. Right. If you are if you're a PhD astrophysicist, but you're sweeping floors, anybody can sweep. They're not going to pay to be a PhD physicist. Exactly. Floor, right? right. Exactly. They'd be so, stupid to do that. Exactly. So I think a lot of people lose sight of that, right? And I think a lot of it, you see, especially in, in, in a lot of younger people, and uh, that it's it's a social media, right? Oh, yeah. You know, you know this. You know, this guy does this at Facebook. This guy does this at Microsoft. This guy's 21 and drives a Lamborghini and he sells houses. You know, it's it's all. Yeah. A, a good example, I, had a fr I have a friend. She does HR for a nonprofit in, in a small town, Arkansas, right? Mm -hmm. She is complaining because another friend of us, ours, does HR for Amazon. and gets paid like almost twice as much. I'm like, <laughs> you're HR. How do you not know about labor markets? Exactly. What are you doing, right? You, you think this nonprofit is going to pay as much as this Amazon? person like are you kidding me right now like what are you doing and, like, and like are you, are you on linkedin saying this shit you make yourself look fucking stupid i know and it's and it's not even apples to apples no right? like it's uh, amazon 
or then you have places like, you know, someone to say someone is like, um, I don't know, we'll say the janitor, right? Janitor birthday. And they found out a janitor in the same office building with 10 year experience has paid like 25, they get paid 18. Yeah. I need 25. Well, are you kidding me right now? Hey. No. Yeah. But so many people expect that, right? And that's, and that's, I think, a problem. Too much information coming without context. Yeah, context is so much missing yeah, so many context times. Context is critical. You don't have the context. You, yeah, we all think we're being cheated in some way or some way. Don't be wrong. Learn what your value is, right? And I, and I want to say be realistic, right? But like, you know, you, yeah. you, I mean, like, your first job at college is probably going to be $300,000, even, even if you're a software developer, right? What you're doing. But, you know, then you'll go and you look at the blind or <clears throat> glass door mm -hmm. and you, and, or even read it. Yeah. Average pay, you know. Yeah. But that's some guy with 25 years who wrote the language that you're actually, you yeah. know, who, who created design and built, you know. Um, but I, I think, you know, a lot of times it's people who, I think there's so much comparing people, people comparing themselves. To other what, what somebody say? I can't, somebody said this as famous. Um, some like comparison is a thief of joy or something like that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It drives envy. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that envy and jealousy drives so much of the unhappiness that we have in this world. But I really believe, man, you know, you know, people always tell me stuff. I'm corny for thoughts like this, but I really believe that if you are, if you help people to succeed mm -hmm. and if you're happy for other people's, um, achievements and what they get the goodness will come to you yeah right? i like, believe that too yeah and then you know you get what you give golden rule all this other stuff that we call it but i mean sometimes we're still having faster you know <laughs> yeah 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 you know? <laughs> you know but you know you think like you know i think about like you know we all we all have friends who you know especially when you get kind of where i am in age you know, we're, we're the same so you know you, you you've seen the people who didn't make it who let ego drive them, yeah. the people who didn't, who made the wrong they choices. They scared up this a little bit. Yep. Who made the wrong choices. And, you know, I, I just think it, we get so little time on this world. Yeah. You, you, you got to take advantage of it. You got to spend it. Happy. I mean, I saw somewhere it said, like, us being alive is a one attorney chance, you know, because, like, what if our six grandparents <laughs> down the line got killed by, you know, monkey pox or black yep. plague or died or, I mean, that's just so random, right? Yep. I mean, yeah, there, yeah, and people will still spend their time chasing, you know, chasing this or chasing that, and never being happy because you'll never have enough. No, right? Like if you're that person, you'll never have enough. Instead of just sitting back and being like, "Look, man, I got," you know, you know, you know, I, wherever situation you are, there's always somebody who would just die to be in your situation. Oh yeah, yeah, right? and that's what people forget. And people are constantly unhappy because they're always looking to be that person, that other person. Like, no, just take a moment, man. Be in yeah. your place. Be in your body. I mean, I'm making this up, <clears> course, but like the thing is, like you know, most of the world does not have a decent place to stay, clean water. You know, if you're if you're if you have a roof over your head, eating three times a day, have clean water, you're doing better than probably over half the Earth's population. Absolutely, absolutely, especially here. Right? We, we we're very spoiled. I was a uh, I was uh, walking with a friend the other day, and we were uh, we were on the the campus, and they had this flavored water. Uh, it's like you know, like the mint and lemon and all that. And she said, "Only in the United States do really people really have to flavor their water to get them to drink it." And I was yeah. like, "That's actually pretty. Yeah, that's yeah. actually pretty interesting to think about, right?" And I was like, huh. "I mean, most people don't realize a lot of poor people, like really poor people across the world, would kill to be the poorest American." Don't get me wrong, just poor people here, like having a bad, like homeless people and like mm -hmm. human abusive relationships and like bad stuff goes on. But on average, like, you know, most people like have opportunity to succeed. Like here's a one for you I've asked before. Would you would you rather be like, we'll say, the poorest person in like South Chicago, Appalachian Mountains, you know, as the poorest person that no no opportunity, you know, no support system, or someone that lives in North Korea? I was taking Appalachia. Yeah, I mean, it's, not, it's not even close, right? Yeah, not, yeah, not even close. But how many of those people don't see yeah. that as an opportunity? They're like, oh, I'm, 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 oh, will be me, right? Because people always compare themselves to people who are on Instagram, who, whose circumstances are better, at least in yeah. image, right? 
and you know, you know, I would take your question a little further. Would you rather be rich and miserable or poor and happy? Yeah. Right. You know, that's, and <clears throat> people, they, they call it that, what do they call it? The social comparison. Mm -hmm. Like people always will, will never have, did you ever say there's a, there's a, actually a TikTok where they, they were saying, would you rather, if you, they asked people, they said, would you rather have a job where you made $50 an hour, but your coworkers made a hundred dollars an hour? Or would you rather have a job, that same job, where you make twenty dollars an hour, but your coworkers make eighteen dollars an hour? And which one do you think people? The pick? twenty dollars. Exactly. Like, right. What's, it, your, what's your value is that? Exactly. Right. It, and that's. But there's so much of that, and that's. So when I got the army, I had to I had to get my HR certification, right? Mm -hmm. And the instructor told the story where, at a company I worked for way back in the day, there was a lady. And he said this lady did nothing, right? Got paid good money, did like me one thing a day. She quit because she found out someone was doing less than her and they wouldn't pay her more. The lady was doing less than her. So she quit. Wow. Like, and the guy's like, we're like, what the fuck? Like you're doing nothing. People shoot themselves in the foot all the time. People make decisions based off ridiculous short term, you know, decisions. And, and it always happens. And, you know, that's, that's what I think, you know, what, if, if you're a grown up, eh, that's all right. But like for the kids, right. Trying to focus the kids, and get the kids back to, or get young people in general, back to focusing on, you know, making decisions that, you know, kind of do a do an analysis, right, on before you make a decision like that. <clears throat> because, you know, there's a lot of, you know, for in the 90s, right, late 80s, 80s, 90s, the decision was, do I sell drugs or do I not? Do I break in this house or do I not? Right. But now it's, you know, do I do nothing or do I not? Or yeah. do I, you know, do, you know, and, and, and you know, I love entrepreneurial spirit. <clears throat> I love that. But, you know, young people, I mentor a, a couple of young guys. And these guys are, you know, they're, they're, oh, you know, I don't need college and all this. I'm like, hey, all right, you don't need college. But, you know, as we start talking and they tell me some of their ideas and, you know, I'm like, bro, just because you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad doesn't mean that you <laughs> you understand how the world works, right? And that dude sells books. And, you know, you may follow this other guy. You don't know how this guy really got his money, but he, you know how he just got your money. Yep. You know, you just paid him 64 bucks. And then if, if you know, 50,000 people paid him, then then you guys are making him rich. You, it's kind of like a... No, Almost like a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, it is. It is, right? And it's <clears throat> it's just like you you follow these people who are unqualified to talk about a topic. And, and just because someone has a hundred thousand followers on Instagram does not mean they know what the fuck they're talking about. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. One thing I learned uh, like a couple years ago, I had no idea. You can actually buy followers on social media. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I had no clue. Like, what? Absolutely. You can buy followers. You can buy likes. You can buy five-star ratings. You I, can had, buy anything. I had no idea. That blew me away. And that definitely changed by the way I look at different accounts, right? Like, yep. do you really have a hundred million followers? Yeah. And then, you know, like I said, people, <clears throat> you know, I think that the, you know, a lot of the social media companies, they're just okay with it too, right? Yes. It, it, it drives people to that. Because if someone has like two million followers, more people are going to follow the content and ads and stuff, you know, so they don't care. Yeah. And, you know, and I think a lot of times we've lost, in, in, in many situations, you know, a lot of us or a lot of our community, a lot of our society, especially in social media, People forgot that there is really a truth, right? Like you can hear people say things, yeah. But there is a truth. The truth is the truth, right? The truth is the truth, yeah. And that that person doesn't necessarily tell the truth. And you know, I like what now. My social media is probably is just as full of people who debunk what yeah. you know false shit that people say than the people who are saying the false shit. Have you seen this meme? It was a while ago where. Someone, someone, there was a number six, 69 was, as I was saying, someone said it's 69, all of a sudden it was the 96. <laughs> and, and then the press wrote, wrote up, I wrote that, I wrote that as a 96. Oh, see? Yeah. See? I and mean. It, and, but people will believe, man, if, if, if you get the right person saying, oh man, 69, people will definitely believe that shit. So, your job title now is program manager, correct? Mm -hmm. What the fuck is a program manager? Like you just manage people and tell them what the fuck to do? Or what is that? Explain that how that came about, like all that kind of stuff. So, you know, if you can think about program management, it's interesting because anybody's going to talk about me on LinkedIn now. So if you think about program management, like I think a lot of, if you think about a project, right? 
by definition, like textbook, project is, you know, it's something you undertake that has a beginning and end. <clears throat> so if I'm going to build a house, I'm done when I'm done building the house. Right? If you have a program, it's typically like a series of projects that are aligned to a, a, a similar topic or the same topic. I would say. So <clears throat> you have, you know, as a program manager, you typically have you typically have a bunch of different projects that you're managing all the time. Some of them are a project that you're managing as fires you're putting out. Some are you're trying to drive additional value into your your program or out of your program. And I need to update my LinkedIn. My actual job title is I'm a customer experience program manager, but I work in the partner space. And so what that means is, you know, if you think about uh, at Microsoft, as, as Microsoft puts out new products and new functionality from Azure, I work in the cloud, mode, or cloud and services or in the partner center. In these interfaces, any interface that you use, you know, we'll make it more general. Any interface that you use, if you're using Word, if you're using your email, if you're using PowerPoint, if you're using anything, any product, any IT product you use, they're going to be changes, updates, versioning, and, and um, <clears throat> those changes are going to work for some people and they're not going to work for others. And some, for sometimes, you know, the reason they don't work for others is could be technical, right? If you, so if you built, if you took any website from today and you took it back 20 years ago, the computers wouldn't even work, right? You wouldn't be able to load the first page. You know, some of the, you know, some of the images on pictures, remember back when it used to take two or three days to download a movie? Like, like, think about that, and you think about you. You try to look at a website that's a quarter what a movie is, so you know you're looking at twelve hours to render one page. So that's just like so. There's sort of a technical issue that can make some products not work, and it's usually I mean it's not it's loading speed, but that's just the example. And oftentimes, there's people who there's products that, from a usability perspective, right, it's just it doesn't work for some people. For instance, um, if you let me think of a good one. You ever you ever go to those websites? These are per, they're designed this way on purpose to where you look at something, it's a message, you know it's a fucking pop up, you're not really interested, but the X doesn't appear right away. Oh so fucking small. Right? So you think about or it's small or it's hard. Like, oh, it's somewhere like not even the picture is like on the lower right corner corner. Exactly. Those are called dark patterns, but sometimes people do it not on purpose, but on accident. Right. And so, you know, if you do it on accident, then that's gonna cause a problem usability that's on your website anybody so if everybody coming to your website can't have the same positive experience there's a problem that can be identified right? so as a program manager there, there's constant updates going on there's outages you know in the tech world where i am at least there's outages that you know um, may occur whatever it may be someone has to be there to fix it and then at the end of the day there's, there's these teams are geographically dispersed there's hundreds of thousands or thousands of people so as a program manager in this case, right? So they can program manager versus project manager, ongoing, right? And <clears throat> you're, you're making sure that all this information is rolled up. Everybody's aware because somebody else found it and somebody else is going to fix it. It's the PM's job to, to get those people together in this case and to make sure it happens and to, to cap it off and let everybody know it's fixed. And then as a PM, you know, in the context that I work as well, you need to look at how products are doing. Like, well, I, you know, I literally run enormous queries to look at how are customers using the products and where are customers having problems. Um, you know, sometimes the problems are technical issues like bugs, but sometimes the problems are, you know, customers who are partners who are saying, "Hey, man, you got you guys didn't design this for me, right? I have to take this additional step in order to effectively use this data, or effectively use this report, or effectively." you know, use this process. So driving a fix to that um, is, is another thing. And, and these are all under the umbrella of program manager. So if you're a program manager for a specific area, and, and you could take that up a level, right? So if you think sort of like a, like a, like a, a tier structure, right? You know, you have a program manager who's at the very top of all projects, right? like the CEO, right? He's a, he's a program manager and he's overall, the, the company itself is the program. And then you can go down to, 
you know, down a level and then you go down to sort of that division of EP level and then down, down, down. And then you get to a level where you have a number of program managers who are fixing responsible for different areas of an enormous product offering in some situation or, you know, in, in a nonprofit sense, right? You're a program manager there. You're responsible. Basically, your, your projects don't end. And it's your job to make sure it's running smooth. So on a personal level, how do you determine personally if you're being successful as a program manager? Like, how do you grade yourself, so to speak? You know, I grade myself on, well, there's usually oftentimes a lot of other external measures, right, that, that say, hey, you're doing something right or you're doing something. And for me, right, so we have developers who build stuff in this case, or, you know, it, there, there's always a measure of, your effectiveness in, because anytime you do something, you're thinking it's going to be, you know, this is what I'm going to cost. This is what it's going to cost me. And this is going to be the benefit or the ROI. And just keeping an eye on those two, you know, if it's, you know, if it's at my job, if it's at my job job, it's saying, hey, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to drive this fix. I need to have it done by this day. If I'm tracking, um, you know, those are those easy, visible, um, easy, visible uh, ways to measure my effectiveness that I see, but also, you know, it's, it's the relationships that, you know, you make and maintain and you nurture um, as you're doing your projects or as you're working your program, right? Like if, you know, one of the things I tell anybody, any person who's ever worked with me, especially in a mentor type situation, I always say, if someone says, hey, I got to work with Aubrey, if people cringe, I'll know I'm doing something wrong. But if people are like, oh, cool, you know, and I know I'm doing something right. So that measure is almost as important to, to me, yeah. not to the people who are paying me to do stuff, yeah, exactly, but to right. me, yeah. um, that's getting stuff. Right. Um, so do you consider yourself a, a, like a technical person? Yeah, I have, a, I have a lot of tech. So what does that mean to be a technical person? So I think, you know, if you think of a, you know, a technical person, I think it, so I think a lot of people can use something someone else built. But if you're a technical person, I think you're able to build it yourself or build it without the user. Like you think about a website, like if you think about this or anything you're looking at, we're looking at something that some super smart technical person made easy for us to understand. But, you know, you see people who type in a command prompt, right, where they're just typing into that little black square and it's, uh, you know, that writing. Like if you're able to go in and you're actually able to work with the nuts and the bolts, and the guts without the without that extra step that somebody put in there for you to understand it easily, then you're a technical person. And it's different degrees, right? Like you have some people who, you know, you know, I'm, you know, if you had to look at a scale from one to ten. Actually, that's my next question. Oh, okay. On a scale of one to ten, what do you rate yourself as a technical person? Me myself, I have a very firm grounding of if you if you look at technical concepts, right? Like I said, they they run the gamut. Let's say in application design, I would rate myself pretty high, right? Not as high because I'm not as efficient. And then, you know, you think about even if you go there, so we go to application design, you kind of like have, you know, sort of the, the more, I can build something to get it done, get the job done. But, you know, when you start actually seeing actual production ready, you know, shipped code where it's man got try catch blocks, all the error handling, everything is tracked. I'm, you know, just getting it done. I'm a night eight or a nine, but production level, I'm a six or a seven, right? Like, and it's, but I have that grounding and years of experience so that I could sit there and figure out how to get it right. If I look at code, I've never seen code I don't understand ever. Um, well, not in, not in many many years, uh, but. Uh, so when you see companies that build write code mm -hmm. and you really see it, it's like, wow. Yeah. No, I, my brain doesn't really work yeah. that way. I need a guide and a when there's frameworks for everything, mm -hmm. right? Oh, that's, that's another way, right? I can use a framework. A technical person could probably use their frameworks a couple of times and then not need to actually use the guidelines from the framework in order to do technical things. Now, hardware, I have no idea. Okay. Not even a little bit. Okay. <laughs> So let's go back to your daughter in college, right? And this, this has this uh, hypothetical situation. Let's suppose your daughter, um, like her first semester senior year, right? And y'all been talking about going to college, whatever, different colleges. And your daughter comes to, hey, dad, like, um, 
I don't know about going to college. What I want to do is blank. And here's my plan to be successful in blank. And going to college is not needed there. Here's my plan. She has a detailed plan, like studying, like whatever case may be. And, and to be like, be successful, like within six, seven years. Right. Would you be like, okay, I'll give you two years to try this out. You're on a college or fuck that bullshit. You're on a college right now. Like what would you actually be? You know, it depends. Right. If it's a well laid out plan. Um, but at, at that, you ever see that thing where I say, when you when your kid gets old, you move your role from provider to advisor. Yeah. Yeah. You know, at, at that point, right. You know, I feel like, Hey, I've done all I can. If you have a plan that you feel like it's going to work. And then I would try to advise her on that plan. Okay. I would try to talk her into staying in college. Yeah. Definitely. But it depends, right? If she decided that she wanted to go for underwater basket weaving, mm -hmm. but she has a plan that's going to, you know, let me, maybe your plan is, yeah. this, right? at the end of the day, you know, I, I feel like we could provide the information, right? And we can provide the lessons and we can provide the examples of consequences. But at the end of the day, it's up to them, right? Yeah. If, if she chooses, you know, if she chooses that, Inside, my heart probably broken a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> but I'll, yeah. I'll be. I keep my supportive face up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're deeply involved with tech. What new tech out there excites you? Like is it AI, is it like genetics, is it like all this? There's so much stuff going on out there. What what kind of excites you right now? You know, you know, it's funny. Like from a tech perspective, it's Microsoft probably took a plug. <laughs> no, I like AI. I really do like AI. Um, and. You know, it's funny, it's, AI is so big, right? And there's so many things that it can do and there's so many things that it's going to do. I think that that's definitely something that excites me. Like I can just, you know, you know, you can, you can say, just copy and paste some text and say, write this up to an email um, in Klingon and it'll do it, right? And, or summarize it, summarize this. Like there's so many, there's so many ways that it helps people, right? There's so many ways that it can help people. Um, but on the other side of that, you know, you think about, I used to be a pretty good writer, writer and a pretty good speaker, right? Like now people can write better stuff than me with a click of a, a button, right? Then you think, you know, some of the things that, you know, people are afraid of and that used to be sort of development or opportunities or competitive advantages for other people. It, it's sort of an equalizer. In a way, yeah, there's a lot of good tech out there. AI, I don't think most Americans realize how much AI is going to change the whole world, right? And they have no, like, no clue at all, right? Oh, yeah. Like, most people have, didn't know, have no idea how the internet's going to change the world, right? Back in the day, yeah, yeah, now it's everything. I think AI is, I think AI is going to be a big one. And, I, and I, I really think that, you know, it's funny to see you take coding and you take, mm -hmm. um, so what happens when, when, AI and I've heard, you know, you know, you see little, I don't really no detailed analysis, but I know DARPA is working on something where AI can write code, right? You don't even need to be skilled. To write. So I wanted this uh Karutsu forum right on Thursday, I think, right? Like so these 10 companies pitched like 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 they get invested like a million plus dollars, right? There's one kind of code valet, that's the model, right? The AI will do the code for you, right? Mm -hmm. You do them some Genex text, whatever, basic structure and the code. The AI does the code for you. So basically, they're like putting all the junior developers out of business. But you know, you think about then you go back and you look at the lesson of Excel. Mm -hmm. Remember, they were like, oh man, Excel's going to put accountants out of business because once you build these formulas, then anybody's basically an accountant. But no one is fucking smart enough to build the formulas. Yeah, I know, right? All right. But and in theory, you'd have only one person who could build a bunch of formulas. Yeah. So you would need one, you know, accountant type. People weren't person with that skill. But as you see, it's not really. And, yeah, but I do think once AI can write code, you know, I, I think about then will art, because then it'll be how do you ask the question instead of being able to, you know, if I said, oh hey look, <clears throat> I'm the PM, I'm the designer, I'm the the tech guy, uh -huh. write this code that does this. Yeah. So this guy that writes this code that does this is gone now. So this skill becomes important, and is this skill more art? or skill, mm -hmm. right? Like it's, so does then, maybe I do wish my daughter had went to school for fashion right. design or something artistic because she understands how to ask the questions in a way that is, is general and usable for everyone. Here's one for you. Let's suppose either you or your daughter have to have like, let's say knee surgery, right? Mm -hmm. Do you rather have a doctor do it, human doctor or AI do it? 
it depends. You know, it depends. Once AI gets it right, um, but like I know, you know, AI doesn't do well with exceptions. Yeah. Right. And then you know, one of my torn meniscus that I had cut, you know, that little piece cut off of it. Oh, that's not meniscus. That's just meat. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Let's cut yeah. that. Then you yeah. lose your leg. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think that as things get more and more advanced, you know, because you know, with these machine learning systems, you got these AI. You know, some AI teaches itself. Mm -hmm. So, if you know, if you basically watch, if, if you have a system that watches thousands of dollars or doctors do thousands of surgeries over thousands of days or year, or thousands of days or weeks or whatever it may be, then yeah, you know, in no time. You know, but then doctors are also, yeah, right, and then you know, and with that, like. I think the question changes if I tell you the doctor finished last in his class and has two malpractice lawsuits against him, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Then it definitely changes. Then let AI do. It, yeah. Right. But you know, you think about it, like, you know, AI. When you go to a doctor, you say your symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. You might take your shirt off and listen to your heartbeat, listen to you breathe a little bit, but that's not going to hurt the. You know, that's that's not going to be really in depth look at you know your pain that's internal. Like, hey, like I feel like my intestines or x y and z yeah. like your doctor's not gonna you know you know do anything to your yeah. intestines there so you know what happens when ai starts to replace that first visit with the doctor yeah. you're just going through your symptoms right and then and i think those days are closer than people realize yeah the days are like on star trek star wars robots like doing that medical stuff i think that's closer than people realize yep yep you know man I, you know i go to my doctor and i say hey man you know my eye hurts oh your eye hurts all right um, well, hey, do this. They're like, don't, don't use your eye no more. <laughs> I know, right? All right, hey, drink some water, though. No. Or, you know. Thanks for ibuprofen. Yeah. Oh, man, I got this pain in my chest. Okay, well, let me listen to this, All right? If it's not a heart attack level, you're still going to get something that's based off of minimal amount of data. Yeah. And that, I think, could could be replaced. But, man, I hope not. Yeah. Um, can't sue a computer. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So I think that, yeah, I think those days are coming. All right. So let's move on to the, uh, you're, so you're the president of the board for Community Network Council, correct? Mm -hmm. So it's a nonprofit of Kent. So what does, and they've been around for like, they've been around for like 10, 15 years? Well, they've been around for a long, much longer. Okay. And this iter the current iteration is about, yeah, 12 to 15 years. And from my understanding, y'all do academic coaching for disadvantaged kids? Um, You know, we could do it for any kid. Okay. But typically, you know, if you think of, if you think of, so academic coaching, I guess I probably should start the beginning. So basically, if you think of, you know, what, what we do is if you have a, a kid who has a marker for, you know, a, 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 a potentially negative, um, I'm trying to think of a, a nice euphemism. If you have a kid that, that the kid, the school could see is at risk, right, for attendance, for behavior, or, you know, kids fight too much, he misses too many days, or he just, you know, needs some help academically. So if the kids are best and the brightest, you're probably not helping them out, right? <laughs> Unless their parents want us to, but okay. hey, that'd be a score. I don't know. Right now we do. Yeah, but we could, right? Because sometimes parents come to us and they just want some help for their kid, right? Some, some kids just need a little bit of support. Um, but so if, if you think of, okay, we have a kid who's has uh, one of the risk markers, he's at risk, and so our program, we basically have people. Um, so we have staff in our that that work at the school to interface with that kid during the day, but also to interface with that the students' teachers to make sure you know that the student is you know doing having the best experience possible and getting some support throughout the day as needed. And so if you think about like there's like this junction between the school, the student. And, you know, the parents, that's where our program fits, kind of in that middle, right? So we're in the school do it with your child during the day. We're making sure your child is, is, is doing you know, their best or some goals. We, we use a lot of goal setting. Your, your child is doing, you know, keeping up on his goals. We can check in with the teachers, make sure that that interaction is, is good. And back to what I was telling you about, sort of that PTA, that PTA mindset of, you know, when people, you know, relationships, when you, People do, when people are watched, you know, behavior change, right? And that's in general situations. Just look up police cases once they put body cams on. Just kidding. No, I'm kidding. But no, but people generally act a little, you know, change their behavior. 
action. We we use that model or that to to make sure that the student is acting way that he's acting, but also making sure that his academic experience. And who pays for this? So typically we have donors, right? It's we're we're heavy grant funded, um, and you know we have grants that fund our support uh, for students, uh, and you know what we do is you know, we as our, our we have success stories. We use data to track, you know, is, is the student getting better? You know, if you had a student who started out as a D or an F student and our goal, you know, is reasonable and reachable, right? And we want to get the student to be a C student or better, then we're tracking that and we give that data to our donor. And does the school apply for the student? The student applies, the parent applies? How does the application process work? So typically there's more of an option matrix. We have a memoranda, memorandum, this would be memoranda, plural of understanding with schools. And so we do that, we recruit at school events, right? We go to, you know, when schools go back to school, there's typically a, an orientation day or, you know, for instance, yesterday, um, there was a, like a, a, a nonprofits and kids got together and, uh, and we were able to get, you know, people there to say, hey, here's some flyers. If you have a student who's in need, or, you know, I've seen cases literally where a grandmother um, who was taking care of her grandchildren came up to us and said, hey, I need some help. Right? And then, like I said, we go beyond. We do the, the academic relationship is how, what defines our academic coaching, but it's also we, we try to support you know, our students beyond just making sure you get grades. Right? So what do you need? What do you, parents, what do you need for your student in order to, to excel? Right? Your kid missed 67 days last year. We wanted to miss less than 40 this year. What do you need? Alarm clock, no problem. But you know, some of our students deal with homelessness periodically, right? and some of our students deal with, you know, it could be any any of a, a lot of things that you know, uh, make education and pursuing education harder. Can a student be like too bad of a student? Like, can I suppose a student has like skipped half the school year, has a criminal record, you know, like beats his mother up, you know, is someone like too far gone, so to speak, to get help from y'all? No, I mean, <clears throat> I think that a student who's that, you know, that that troubled would probably not even be, wouldn't even be eligible, right? Okay. We uh, we wouldn't be, be out of school, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, it's funny because, you know, back in the day, and I'm I'm sure that you know the other members of Barbara and Shella when they watch this, you know, when you know prior to me joining full fledged, um, you know, we had a work your way back program where students who were suspended for I would, you know, nothing, nothing that's gonna be get you jail time, obviously, but long suspension, weed, for instance, yeah. having weed at school. You know, a student gets suspended for ninety days, but you know, the CNC Community Network Council would partner with local businesses where that student could actually work mm -hmm. at that business as help, like as a labor. You know, actually, you know, show up on time, do a good job, work hard, and for every one day that student worked. Uh, at that business, it could be three or five days off their suspension, but also that student got to stay up on his homework. Mm -hmm. And so you had a chance versus a 90 day suspension is gone. Yeah. So it's, a, it's it, you, I mean, it's a chance to still move forward in school. So how does this work? Like, suppose the kids in your program, right? And let's say the, pro, the parent is not really supportive, right? They're like, okay, whatever. Like, how do you deal with that? Well, the kids trying to do good. But the kids are, hey, you know, I really want to do better, but, you know, I have this stuff going on at home. Mom's not really supportive. That's a support. They expect you to do other things. Like, how do y'all deal with that situation? You know, in those situations, it's, I mean, you know, you got to respect the family. Right? You got to respect the family. But remember, we, we're with the student during the day. Um, and we have that ability to affect a lot of change with a direct supportive relationship with the student. But, yeah, you got to, I mean, you, 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 you can't override the parent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's. But a, what if you know mm -hmm. that you should override the parents? What if you know, like, man, these parents don't have this kid's best interest at heart, right? You know, is it, aside from, because the school would also be involved. Right? Mm -hmm. So the school has to report okay. abuse. Yeah. The school has to, I mean, if your kid is out of school too much, right? There's rules that we don't really have to, there's, there's other measures and controls that would help in that situation. But. Um, you know, if typically that's always handled. Okay. 
And you only deal with Kent Independent School District, right? The Kent schools? Um, yeah, in general. Right? Is there a plan to expand later on, like go to different cities? There is a plan to expand, but one of our one of our tenets of our program is in order to support a student, there there's required consistency. Mm-hmm. We have to always be where we say we're going to be. Our teams have to always be where they where we tell the student we're going to be. And, you know, you'd be surprised what modeling consistency can do and being having it, being that steady hand on a student. I, mean, I know, it's nature of question. But being that steady hand on a student, and, and with that, it's hard to, but typically whenever, you know, you go back to your product, the, your product design days or product management days, you'd have sort of a minimal viable product. For us, that would be putting volunteers in a school before we fully commit. It's hard to find volunteers who have that availability. Um, and, and there's a process, right, in order to work with students. There's a process that requires background checks and all this other stuff. So long story short, we would like to expand. We do have some plans. Um, you know, every year when we do our strategic planning, we always talk about moving to other areas. But Kent's big. Yeah, like Kent, it's not a small or, city. Yeah, Kent's big, so that's cool. So how how does someone become an academic coach? They have to have like a minimum amount of education. I'm assuming you like do some hellified background checks, right? Like, how do you like actually vet and hire academic coaches? Yeah, you know that's actually a really good question. So typically, <clears throat> the vetting of of the person is important. You have to be able to pass. You know, the, in order to be around kids, period, for any organization, you have to pass the Washington State Patrol test and. We even take it deeper, and we do a national t- uh, background check uh, to make sure that you know, a person doesn't have, you know, that a person is safe to have kids. From the experience perspective, it depends, right? Like, you know, uh, a degrees. Many of our people have degree, let's say, but the degree isn't necessarily a requirement in some situations because, you know, we have guys, guys who are basketball coaches at high school. Right, those guys connect with students better than because it's about the connection, and they connect with their students better than you know I could. I do, I guess. but but you know, so but the degree it's the background. What is your experience working with kids? What is your experience working with kids, uh, diverse kids? What is your experience working with kids who may have had some challenges and struggles? Right? What is your experience working with kids who may not act the way you know? You know, it's just, yeah. it's, you know, but, yeah, so a degree isn't required in it. So is the, is like, what's the goal for y'all? Is like, have one coach, coach like five kids, 10 kids, is it like a metric for that? It depends. Um, it depends. So when we have our coaches, we assign them by school. Um, and, you know, we have, in, you know, at some of our facilities, we have built, like actual buildings and rooms where the students can come. That way we can connect with a lot of, you'd have two or three coaches connecting with 15 kids. Um, and it's, you know, it's that question of, hey, you know, like I said, that check it. And it's funny, man, it's so cool to see the kids come and, and like I said, they have a place they can go. And, you know, to me, um, it seems as if the students know that they're a part of sort of a special cohort. Mm-hmm. It builds that relationship between them that helps our coaches to, to, to have that relationship. Uh, but in younger kids, right, we have programs that are, we will have one coach for assigned to a number of students because the number of students goes up and down. And what's the age group y'all deal with? Uh, any, it could be any age, but typically you could think third grade to high school. Okay. 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 And then um, is a coaching take place in your office building, the home of the parent, the school? Where does that take place at? No. Coaching takes place at the school. Okay. And But we do do home visit or parent visit, we call it, mm-hmm. where we connect with the parent coaches. And that's basically to get that the parents take on how they feel like their student is doing, um, and you know any course corrections we need to make in order to. Have you ever had a situation where a parent was hostile? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and you know, we, you know, we adjust our policies, yeah. and you know, there's sometimes you know, domestic violence. And yeah. Can you tell us like one, maybe one or two success stories? Yeah. Yeah, a lot. Okay. Um, you know, we've had students who. That's act- good up some. Oh yeah, you know one 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 of the things that I think is a success story, and a marker, is when you have a student who comes back every year, mm-hmm. and because that says that student 
is getting something out of the program and the parents are getting out, getting something out of the program and the school to a degree is getting something out of the program. Like I don't have an exact, you know, kid was this and went to yeah. this, but there are many, we have students who have come back multiple years and they graduate and we have a, you know, every year we have a graduation ceremony where, you know, our kids that are, that are walking across the stage, I mean, you can, no one can take credit for everything, right? But, um, or even nearly everything. Because <clears throat> as I said, it's the parents' responsibility, but we have had a- The kids have responsibility, you yeah, know. And the kids, yeah, excuse me, yeah. And, and, but we can say that, hey, we helped that kid along the way. A kid that is walking across the stage that may may not have been walking across the stage. Can you talk about a kid, I mean, I mean, don't be the name you don't want to, but a kid like, you know, they start off maybe seventh grade, like horrible student, bad situation. And then at high school, they had to pick up any college they want to go to, right? Yeah, well, so so for me personally, I can give you an example okay. um, of a student. I don't know. I can't say he had to pick up college, yeah. I say, but I can't say if he could pick up any college he wanted. But we had one student, there's a video, I'll actually send it to you, where you know he's talking about the troubles that he had in school. School just wasn't for him. He was with a bad crowd of students. Uh, his mother actually spoke on our video that you know she came to us and like the, the letter that she wrote, um, and it's sort of it's a testimonial, it, it's touching. It's like, hey, my, I mean, I'm worried for my kid's life, basically. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, you know, that today's day and you know day and age, that's not a stretch in many situations. Right? And so <clears throat> we were able to work with that kid, right? And like I said, our coaches, man, are the best. Our coaches are able to connect with kids in a way that. You know, I, I think about, like, remember the boys' club commercials and, like, those? Like, it's that yeah. connection where the yeah. kid comes in, and they come in, they're shining. And, and this particular kid, you know, he told his story after, um, you know, as he graduated. And, like I said, remind me to send you the video. But he was talking about, yeah, the organization saved my life. Mm -hmm. you know, I graduated. I can go to college. He's, he's accepted to college. Um, and, you know, I, I'd have to look up the specifics okay. uh, for him. But... No, he is definitely, I'll send it to you. It okay. was touching, man. especially the mother. Part, right? Like, Yeah, that's powerful. It, it's powerful, man. Like when you're, when you're a parent and you're like, man, look, my kid, I, we all know education is good. Um, you know, if you go to those basic things that we all know that we want to give our kids, but we may not have those tools in our toolbox, right? Like for me, you know, as, you know, as a black man, I can't even tell you the number of times I've had people come up to me, you know, mothers who said, hey, you know, my, my son needs black male influence. Mm -hmm. These are women who are white, black, Asian, everything. Mm -hmm. And, but they just feel like they want their kid to have some influence that they maybe can't give. Uh, and you want to have a positive person, just like myself, and like I was a knucklehead when I was young. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, Same and, here. And, and, and people took the time, man, to make sure that I was mentored and I, you know, got a grounding on, you know, looking far out there. I tell the kids, Hey, you're going to be old for longer than you're young. Yeah. Right? So make your decisions based on that. Don't go in there trying to do nothing too crazy now because you'll pay for it for a long time. One then trust me, once your energy starts to drop, you ain't going to want to do any of that stuff. Nope. And how many coaches do you have right now? So we have seven coaches. So we have coaches. It's, it's interesting. So we have about seven coaches. Uh, we have, but we have an academic because it's summertime. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, school, school's over for now. And it's, but we have a summer program where we do academic coaching in the summer, but it's, it's a different role, right? It's more of a mm -hmm. work with the school, support the school, but work with our students to make sure that, you know, our students are getting, it, it's not as intense. Right? Okay. Right. So. And how do how y'all determine if a coach is being successful? Is it metrics y'all use? I'm, I'm sure it's definitely each location. I mean, each student and stuff, but how do you determine like this coach is actually like performing, so to speak? You know, so there's a focus on the student, right? And, and so it's one of those things, it's a situation where it's hard to, you could be the best coach on this earth and your students still not do well because there's a million factors that you can't control. Just like I could be the best product designer on the planet, and my product still, because there's still a lot of factors I can't control. But there's a certain set of performance criteria that we have for our coaches that that show that indicate you know are you are you updating your goals with this student one do you have enough goals for the student quantifiable is the student keeping the goals 
not a student, but also a measure. Are you updating our systems with the data that says that quantifiable, right? So it's just through a system of performance management, um, coaching and continuous training. We're able to, you know, because we have to bring, yeah, and that's another thing. Right? Our coaches also get training on, you know, topics, you know, of, you know, domestic violence, uh, how to deal with, you know, uh, IEPs, like, like a lot of different issues that would affect students. But basically we track pretty much everything. That's how we can tell the effectiveness of the coach by the effort they put in. And, you know, a student graduating, you know, at some point, people just get inspired and turn their life. They, or they may sometimes just get sick of being that student. And a lot of times, you know, as people show interest in a student, like I said, that consistent interest and high expectations, you know, the students are able to, you know, they, they, they oftentimes are able to, to deliver excellent performance with us. The CNC have a success metric, success metric, like, you know, like, is it like a, a decrease the number of high school dropouts and can't increase something, decrease something? Like what's y'all's metrics for success? So if you think about, if you think about it, we are, most of our metrics are more at a, you know, we aggregate the performance of our students. So if, if we have student participants who are at whatever uh, level, right? Let's say they're C, they're they're D students, and we want them all to be C students. You can measure the growth from a 2.0 student to a, a 3.3 student. You can aggregate that up and say, hey, look, we've had all of our students had positive growth. All of our students graduated. Our students missed X amount of days. Like we, what the, the elements that we measure are attendance, behavior. So if our students are still getting suspended, either we're doing something wrong, well, they're the element, like we need to put more focus on that student and math and overall academics. So we do math specifically because we're so we're STEM. We're, we're, you know, we have one of our programs, it's a, a financial excellence program where we're trying to meet kids where they are, where social media tells us everybody wants to be rich. So basically helping to drive, you know, students' interest in mathematics by using finance. But so how does this work, right? How does this work in your metric? Like, suppose you have a kid, right? And let's say they're 10th grade or whatever, and they're taking like calculus, right? And they're struggling. And so they decide to drop calculus and take some basic ger generic math and, and then they get an A, right? Mm -hmm. How's that playing the metrics? I mean, so at the end of the day. I mean, because they improved the grade point average, but yeah. did they really improve themselves by dropping from calculus to like generic math? I mean, it would depend on. No, no. Uh, it would depend on like the the the. Uh, it would still be a win if okay. the kid killed it. Like, mm -hmm. If he just did great in school, it would still be a win. But remember, it's the what went into that student to get that student to drop calculus. Mm -hmm. What went into that? Because sometimes you you might pick a class that's too hard for you, mm -hmm. and you know it, the the right choice may be cut bait. Right? Hey, look, if you're not gonna pass it, they were used to struggling for a year. Go and do something that's more at your level. Yeah. Right. And so it's still a win because there's still support for that student um, in the context of academics. Right. You say, hey, you're not doing, you know, the, you know, you're you're struggling in calculus. And like I said, typically the schools still have okay. programs. And are like are there typical schools and can't you like deal with all the time? Like Yeah. You know, okay. You know, a couple high school now you know, elementary school and like how do y'all plan to expand to every school or that the same thing is that any even thing that y'all want to do well the hard thing is finding you be surprised how hard it is to find people who you know just like most jobs right expansion requires additional resources, resources and resources. commitment yeah money and, and money right and then uh, going into a new school is expensive and remember it's consistent mm -hmm. you have to be consistent and because <clears throat> because that's what a lot of our our students are missing They're missing that consistent adult support mm -hmm. and so you know for us expansion you know i actually we were just talking about expanding into a basically expanding our offering more than moving to different schools moving mm -hmm. to new schools so you know community network council we do a lot of different types of activities all under the umbrella of academic coaching but 
we actually have a, a program where we give food for any of our students and community that has food insecurity. Okay. Um, we have, you know, coding program. We have a financial excellence program. That's all uh, under our academic coaching program, but any student can join. Um, and so we, we, we want to establish a permanent location. Um, and it, we've had a lot of conversations of you know, being able to offer a more community-centric. Mm -hmm. Like a community uh, center or something? Center, yeah. And with that, like, man, how do y'all decide what the building is going to be at, right? Like, I mean, you have real estate prices, like, housing safety, like, what's, I mean, you can't imagine the decision process of where to put the building at, right? Like, does Kent have, like, a public transportation system, like, bus system? Uh, Kent has decent public transportation. Okay, so there might be a, I mean, I mean, I would think you need to put, like, one of the maybe within a 10-minute walk from a bus stop, you know? Yeah, yeah. You can't put, like, you know, boondocks Kent, you know, 10 miles out, you know? <laughs> hey, you know, we got Getting the money for this building is, is a big hurdle, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we're, we're working on that. But you know, once we have this building, if you can think of, you know, you have, we have a periodic, like back to what you were saying, sort of when remember you said we had the rich people, mm -hmm. and then you had the people who are not as wealthy, right? Well, if we open doors for you know the people who are not as wealthy, maybe they have the ability to climb that socioeconomic ladder. So we want to actually start bringing in, you know, bringing, getting families the opportunity to come in with your kid, learn to, to code with your kid, or you can learn to use Excel or learn to, you know, computer skills. And, and, and actually, as your son, as your, your child is yeah. learning to do math, watch and, and be a part of it. So this might be a mess of question. There's been a, 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 a situation where a kid came to you and you're, and you're not like, dude, like, you make it straight A's. Like you're like doing this, doing that. You're the, all this kind of cool ass shit. Like, what are you doing here, right? Yeah, I haven't seen that one. Yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, Not yet. Hey, I haven't seen that one yet. But you know, you know, sometimes you know there are other things. So, mm -hmm. especially with younger kids, younger kids really haven't had a chance to. Oftentimes, haven't had a chance to. You know, fall behind, if you will. Mm -hmm. So you know, you, you, every now and then you'll see. Some students come, you know, you are good. Yeah. You are oh good. And, you know, it's good, right? It's, it goes to you know, sort of that secondary benefit of, you know, this is something I think is very important that I make sure my daughter understands. That not everybody's the same. Not everybody comes from the same circumstances. Yeah. You need to be able to operate mm -hmm. with people who may not be from the same background. So talk about the challenges of fundraising for a nonprofit. <laughs> This part, this part, this part, this, uh, this is a podcast episode by itself. In I know, I know. So talk about your challenges of raising know. funds. You know, there's a lot of challenges. So typically, right, there's, you know, as a nonprofit, um, you know, there's, there's, there's published measures. You should say, oh, you know, 50% of your funding should come from grants, 50, 35, whatever it changes. 50 should come from uh, donations and 50 or, you know, 30, whatever to equal 100. Um, Right now, right, and we're in an area where, you know, King County itself has a lot of different, you know, King County is a big funder for a lot of the nonprofits. But King County has a lot of problems and issues, social issues that go beyond just education. Like one could be just like the guy who's downstairs in front of the post office, right? Like homelessness, drug use, policing, ganging you know, gang by all these things are all fighting for a finite set of funds. It's right? good up some. Yep. A finite amount of funds. Harvey, I need to focus on you like being right there. I know. <laughs> I didn't take my pill. No, joking. I know. But like there is a, it's a finite amount of funds. Right. And so everybody has to, you know, there, there's just not as much. Money, right? um, and so, you know, when you have a program that does good work, uh, but you know, when, when, you know, Levies, right? You think about if, if, if school levies or if levies in general pay for some of the the NGO support. Well, man, we're all everybody's feeling the tightness right now, right? Inflation, food prices, rent prices, gas prices. We hear about all that, and it makes people, rightfully so, you know, be be less uh, generous with their with their money. One job I would not want. I would not be. I don't know what the name of the job is, but like. I will not be the person at Starbucks for all these nonprofits send a proposal, right? Yeah. Like, can you imagine like all the proposals? I'm like X, Y, Z, we do this. Like, this, like, man, I will not want that job to decide who gets the money from Starbucks or big corporations to fund because all of them are good to a point, right? 
Yep. And then and then that comes down to impact, right? And yeah. So how do you how do you prove yeah. to a company or to a corporation that the money's being well spent? Like, you know, like do you show them like you know, our admin costs are like, if you give us hundred thousand, only ten thousand dollars of admin costs. Like, how do you prove like the money's going to be like well spent and you're not going to like you know. Like for a better term, go to Vegas and buy cocaine and whores. Yeah, you know? yeah, large amounts of money don't just <laughs> large amounts of money don't just come like that. You got to tell them what you're going to do with it mm -hmm. before they even think about mm -hmm. giving it to you, and then you give them the measures you're expected mm -hmm. to make, and then you tell them if you made it. So typically, you know, you'll the, you know a grant will call out, you know, it'll say, let's say here's ten dollars, right, and. <clears throat> They, the, a grant will say something like, hey, you know, this is a grant that's going to help homelessness, for instance, which is not one we go for, so I can use that as an example. And then you'd say, okay. And they say, how would you use this $10? How would your organization use this $10 to, to do homelessness? I said, well, you know what? I have a program where I partner with local apartments, and, you know, that would be 70 of those dollars. I would use that 70 of those dollars to pay these apartments so they take this the homeless people off the street or homeless, homeless folks off the street, and this will support 10, whatever the number is. Yeah, yeah. The other, then you say, okay, well, my $30 I have left, I'd use two of those dollars to furnish these places and buy food and everything like that. And then one of these dollars I'd use to pay administrative staff, uh, buy pens and pencils, notebooks, and such. So it's usually broken down. They're usually broken down similar to that. And obviously not with $10, but. Yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. And, um, do the same like companies fund you every year? Like if a company like suppose ABC Corporation gives you a hundred thousand dollars in twenty January twenty five, is it pretty like pretty? Uh, what's I'm looking for? The chance of them funding you again next year is like pretty high. Typically, you'll know how many years if you're going for a grant. You'll know how many years you're going. For. Okay. Or you know if the grant goes away, which they often do. Yeah. Right. You can you can know. Um, like, we don't really do a lot of corporations. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, I don't know. Like, I know corporates, corporations will give you typically mm. sort of these, you know, these funds you can do whatever with, but it's usually not very big. Is That's there, a huge number. Oh, go ahead. Now, is there a time when, a, when a, someone gives you good funding, and like, like they say they're too, too needy, like, oh, hey, here's 100000 but you want to be at every board meeting. We want to have, like, input on what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, uh, especially if you get any from any form of local or state government. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, not like board meeting attendance yeah. and stuff like that, but they want to know, they want to know what is your process when a check comes through. A check was dropped off on the door today. Mm. They want to know who's going to pick it up, who's going to take it to, who they're going to take it to, who's going to take it to the bank, what's going to, like, they... Have you ever had to tell a, 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 a entity no, because, man, this is, like, what you want for this money is, is that's too much? Um, Like, you give us $100,000, but you want $100, $100 million worth of stuff from us. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's grants that you just don't go for. Okay. But it's, it's way more formal than my simple analogy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's way more formal. You, you're going to get a lot of information, on what you're expected to do. And, and yeah. And do y'all have like a specific fundraising person for CNC or all everyone involved in CC like does their fundraising. So you have like a specific person. The only job is fundraising. Not, uh, not really. Okay. You know, I mean, we're still small. We're, you know, we're still, we're a very small organization. You know, when you go to those giant organizations, yeah, they have teams of people, but we're still small, right? The same person who uh, sends our emails is the same person who fixes the printers, right? Like, it's, okay. yeah, we're, we're still very small. Okay. But we have high impact. And what is your role as president of the board? What do you, what do you even do? Is that like a dishonorary title? Are you, <laughs> are you actually doing some work? What do you do? Yeah, so, so community network council, we're at a point where, you know, we're kind of taking that step to, you know, when, when nonprofits first start, right? generally everybody, does, it's just like a startup in any, any situation, you know, you might call yourself the president, you might call yourself the executive director, but you do whatever comes up, right? Um, you know, me, president of the board, we have a board who we make sure that the, the organization's financials are sound. We make sure that, you know, the, 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 the policies are in place. Um, and we we're supposed to drive more fundraising. Mm -hmm. right? But like I said, we're still at that point where, you know, as a president of the board, I'm the guy who goes and fixes the printer stuff. I'm the guy who sends marketing requests mm -hmm. to uh, 
uh, graphic artists. You know, it, it, it's still in that moving from the, the working board to the governance board. And how often does a board meet? A uh, month. And what happens at a board meeting? Like, what does the have agendas at different topics each month? What happens at a board meeting? Oh, there's always an agenda. It's typically topics that we have. We do old business, new business, Robert's rules to a degree. I'm not Robert right. rules of order. I'm not. I, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really see it as a Robert rules of order guy. To be honest with you. <laughs> no, it's, trust me, we try. Right. It's, it, you know. I mean, Robert was over. If people don't know, that is the best fucking way to run a meeting. Yeah. It is the yeah. best way. And, you know, like I said, old business, new business, right? Mm -hmm. Like we look at any big changes to the organization, yeah. changes to our programs. We take a look at where we, you know, where, because because the board is not, we don't work at the organization day to day. Right? Mm -hmm. We all have other jobs. So we get updates on the programs. We find out what's working well. If there's any places we need to look at. So what is ex expectation for the members of the board as if you're, if you're, if you're a CNC employee or a member of CNC, the core group, what should their expectation be for the members of the board? You know, it depends, right? It depends. So CNC, we have a, we have a, a group that runs CNC on a day to day, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, board power. And this is actually an interesting conversation that we have all the time. We hear what, you know, the, the, the team at CNC on a day-to-day -day here, but they have a management structure. Mm -hmm. There's a program management, there's program managers, there's performance evaluations, there's salary. Like it, it, Everything is managed just like the other mm -hmm. company, but it's just like, you know, at Microsoft, Microsoft has a board. I don't have a clue what they do. Yeah. They it. Sort of that same similar mm -hmm. situation, but it's, you know, the, I, I say the board has you know, that, that further outlook on the strategy. Mm -hmm. For CNC, and then you know it's, but yeah, obviously we're a small organization, so we all know each other. And how long have you been the president of the board? Uh, since August last year. So okay. About a year. Okay. And as president of the board, what's what's your like personal goal for CNC moving forward? So my personal goal for CNC is, so CNC we we're we're moving in a lot of different directions. You know, primarily education is what I'm interested. In. And I would like to see CNC able to expand to other schools, expand beyond Kent, um, to affect as many students as we can, you know, positive, right? Like I said, I think that that's, that's that core strength, I think, of CNC, being able to meet, like, you know, there's millions of nonprofits, no, but there's a lot of nonprofits there's, out there. There's a lot of fucking nonprofits. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so you think, a lot of nonprofits that's working with students. But then there's a lot of nonprofits working with students of color. There's a lot of nonprofits working with students, you know, uh, yeah. BIPOC students. But CSC does it very, very well. And I think it's a, you know. And so what kind of proof or data do you have that y'all you, do it well? Plenty, right? It's, you, you got the, the data from performance, right, that our students are doing better after they're in the program than they were before. But it's also the impact of the community. Right when you when you hear CNC back to hey you hear CNC you don't go Ugh, you know yeah. it's like all right and schools are asking us to come in there come into their schools like these are all these markers that show I think a big thing too like if you go to Kent people know who Barbara Barbara is right absolutely they know who CNC right absolutely a lot of nonprofits you're like hey have you heard of blah 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 what the fuck is that yeah exactly like, you have no idea you go to Kent like they know what y'all do they know and then like I said it's our and I was like I, I tell you too like so as a president of the board. I go to our locations, I go to the schools. And you could see, like when I when I see how the students interact with our teams, man, you know you're doing something. Right? Like it's, it's it's I don't know, it's just good energy. That that youth energy that's positive in the room that comes from having a an adult in the room that you know you're connected. So what's something you've done in the past that you're like really proud of? Like, man, this like really like really we did this thing, this whatever it was, like really, really, really we showed out on this. For me, right, it's it's just seeing the graduation, the graduation pictures. It's you know, you know, as a as a president of the board, I'm I'm more disconnected. It's more mine is more academic, right? But I go because one, I like to be connected with the team because I've known a lot of them for some years. Um, but just seeing the graduation pictures and seeing, like I said, for me that just seeing somebody make it across the finish line, who, you know, if if if, if we graduate seventeen students then you have to know that at least 
without us, we might be only graduating 60. Yeah. And that's that's conservative, right? That's yeah. very conservative. Could have said. Yeah. But who knows? Yeah. There's no data about that. Ooh. Some, you know, the other influences. So what's something from your point of view that CNC needs to do better? You know, I think, you know, for me, like I'm a, you know, for me, I'm a senior program. Been doing it for a long time. One place I'd like to see us concentrate is, damn, I told you my abs get tired. <laughs> I, uh, you know, as I say infrastructure. Okay. And, and and we have projects that are underway right now to show that infrastructure, to show, you know, we, you know, mo modernizing all of our data okay. that we have, our historical data, for instance, some we still have in paper. We still, you know, want to make sure that, you know, we have inputs from parents, we have inputs from students, we have inputs from schools. Some of that's on paper because yeah. we didn't have an interface for parents to yeah. type us, right? We can't just say email us and we, you know, it's sensitive information about your kids, so we have to Process. So real fast, how do you communicate with people? It's like email, letters, Slack, Instagram DM. Like how do you communicate with people? The 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 just think about the simplest examples you just threw out, and that's how we do it. Okay. Email, phone. Okay. Like school, right? Okay. Um, and remember, like it's you know it's difficult to have um, to use some of these. You know, it's expensive for one. Yeah. Right? Slack, for instance, it's expensive when you're a company. Yeah. Microsoft. The free model is fine, but like you, you, they do what you got to do, yeah. Yeah, and we right now we just over the last couple of weeks we've worked with Salesforce. Uh, we so you know Salesforce gave us a grant and we purchased a couple of different. Um, Cause actually, models. Salesforce actually watched like a while ago, right? Uh huh. They did, yeah. Yeah, they did. Black Monk okay. and Salesforce, maybe like three or four years ago. Okay, so yeah, so, but Salesforce actually gave us there's an education module in Salesforce. And they gave us uh, 10 licenses. We got a couple more. And we had uh, some designers actually create an interface that we'll be able to actually take data directly from and by a form mm -hmm. from parents and from students. On the so how do you all convince Salesforce to do this for you all? Oh, it wasn't really. I mean, you know, they have most big It's a regular program they have? Yeah, most big okay. companies donate to them. Okay. You just got to right. go to like TechCrunch. Okay. Yeah. TechSoup. Go to TechSoup. Okay. And yeah, you can get any product you do you help students get internships? Um, not, I mean, not really. Yeah. Not as much. Yeah. Not really. I mean, okay. it's not that we wouldn't. Because I told you, you know, you're a formal and info. Yeah. The student need to help. And we had some skills that student or resources that student doesn't have. We would try. All right. So next, let's talk. Y'all taking us a really big ass project, right? October 1st or 3rd, y'all's first equity ed education conference, right? Anti race exchange conference we have on the board, right? Yep. Like, I mean, that's a big thing, right? I mean, that's like, that's a big chunk of cheese that's bought off, so to speak, right? So, like, can you talk about, like, how this came about, a vision, that's the whole nine yards? So, you know, historically, you know, over the years, CNC has taken a position of um, just working on that community element of informing the community of, this is before, not, not related to conference. You know, Sound Transit wants to expand the, the light rail, you know, so we go out and work with the community to say, hey, you do you do understand that, you know, some people may, you know, your the house prices along this rail line are gonna go up, you know, they'll be more expensive, there'll be this, there'll be no, you know, just sort of being that notification, that that megaphone um for, you know, the community to to understand some of the issues. And then, you know, you 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 kind of bring that to this next level of you know, one of our big interests is, you know, we have a professional development component uh, of CNC that focuses on um, training, or not training, but, you know, trying to help teachers understand that when you're working with diverse students, the experience may not be the same as you expect. And in all students, for instance, you know, there, there's this old piece of data, it used to be true, I doubt it's true anymore, but You'd have a school district that's like 8% black, but 85% of the students in the behavioral program are black. And that's an indicator that there's there's a misunderstanding somewhere, right? There's there's a, there, there's something that is not, you know, based on reality. So, you know, we have a professional development program where, you know, our team, these are not the academic coaches, this is another team, um, actually works with the schools and and they work with teachers and just say, hey, you know, it's, 
you know, you know, a black a, a black kid may react in a way that you may see as threatening or obnoxious or this. Whereas, you know, we all there's an inherent bias or there's an inherent, you know, prejudice. But there, you just feel more comfortable when a student who looks like you. There's plenty of evidence across the country and that that shows it. So we just basically work with teachers to say, hey, look, let's just recognize. Bring it out. Let's talk about it, and then in return, you know, and not in return, but instead, you know, teachers are able to look at a situation, and instead of saying, "Hey, you know, this is, you know, it's just like we talked about with veterans, right? A veteran could say something you don't like, and you're like, I go back. Mm -hmm. Versus somebody who says they're done, yeah, but like, you know, you take a, maybe a Caucasian teacher who he's a black kid act one way, she's like, oh my God, but if a white kid acts the same way, she's like, I see, you know, he's acting like my little brother used to. Um, so, you know, that, that's fact. So our, our, our special development program has basically grown, uh, and, and now we're here where, you know, we're, it's, it's turning to a conference format, mm -hmm. uh, for that takes a look at sort of race and equity in you know, in education. So kind of off the subject, right? Mm -hmm. Diversity, inclusion, equity, race, equity, all that kind of stuff, right? Let's suppose there's a guy out there, he's Vietnamese, he owns a Vietnamese restaurant, everyone that works for his Vietnamese. Why should this person care about race, equity, diversity, inclusion? Or like, how do you convince him that this is important? I mean, is it, so you know, a person who's Vietnamese has probably also experienced some degree of, like, you know, when people think of racism, people think of overt racism. You think of the KKK riding in your town and horses, mm -hmm. or whatever. It's not that, right? It's it's opportunities that's you know your kids don't get that other kids do get, right? And it spans everybody, including white people, right? Like, I mean, I'm not talking about reverse race. I'm talking about like there's exclusion. You know, the opposite of diversity and inclusion is that ex exclusion piece, right? And we're all all of us. I mean, you got a beard, you're excluded from something potential. You know, I got black skin. I'm excluded yeah. from something potentially. You're Vietnamese. You're excluded from something. Like there's there's something that we're all excluded, from, right? And so that it, it back to if you make the situation good for everyone, the situation is good for everyone. So typically, a Vietnamese family will also benefit from an equally inclusive environment. So talk about some of the challenges of putting this event on. Because people don't realize, like, events, a lot of people think the events just happen, right? Like, you go to an event, yeah. everything's just there. Like, there's a lot of, like, hundreds of details, minute details, like, different changing things. Just talk about the challenges of, like, putting this event on. You know, the challenges are, are related to organization. The challenges are related to um, aligning people who, you know, it's a major event. And you're aligning people who you've never actually seen or watched perform at that level um, to perform at that level. So you're trusting that they'll perform, but you're also trusting that they'll give you key information throughout that process, throughout the process leading up to it, that one shows you that they can do it, but also, you know, just helps you with your planning and your budgeting. That's that's one of the biggest challenges, like getting everybody on the same page. But also, you know, this is a this is a, a for for CNC. This is a new venture, right? This type of activity is new. So we have experts who have had different, you know, similar but different uh, experiences that we're pulling from. But you know, it's 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 making a lot of decisions that you know you you're trying to time something that's going to happen in October. You're 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 trying to tie a schedule together you know, in July or August, and, you know, you're working those details, and, oh, you can't be in town that day, oh, you got this, you know, it's those little, it's it's organization and information, which is the typical things that plague most projects. So this is probably more of a Barbara Phillips question, which comes on a podcast a couple of weeks, but how do you decide, like, which speakers you reach out to, the like, you know, like, presenters, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, yeah. Was it based on reputation, or, like, cost of money, like, that is, that is a, this is more of a barber question. Okay. But um, you know, I would say I met with um I met with a lady 
yesterday. And our main, you know, one of our main uh, keynote speakers is Dr. Joy DeGroote. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wasn't really familiar with Dr. Joy, but <clears throat> the lady was so excited. I remember you telling that story. Yeah, she was so excited. I was like, like I have to go. Like, yeah. can I meet her? Can, yeah, I, she's like, can I meet her? Can I? And I was like, really? And I guess the book, you know, one of her books, mm -hmm. uh, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome, is actually used as a basis of, um, for program design, at least for this lady. Uh, and you know, she I, was, I think you told me the lady everything she does in her personal career is based on yep, Dr. DeGroy, book. her book, right? Yep. And so. That, like she actually owes half her salary made in life to the, to the doctor, right? <laughs> I know. I hope she gives it to me. No, good. But no, yeah. But like it's so you know that you know that's an indicator of you know sort of the big major players mm -hmm. in this area that you know will excite people or that does excite people. Um, doctor Eddie Moore, <clears throat> you know he he wrote the book, you know, a guide for white teachers to teach black boys, which we also use in our you know, curriculum mm -hmm. as well. Excerpt some of the takes. So, you know, the, you know, getting powerful speakers uh, who can really teach, masters of the craft, yeah, really teach and speak to the topic is is the key part. And then these are the people who are. Uh, so, if someone attends a conference, what should the expectation be? Should you expect to get something out of it? I'm obviously hoping they get smarter about different educational things, but like. As far as like we talk about user experience, what should be the user experience someone should expect from attending this conference? You know, one of, one of the main expectations is a lot of us understand, like if, if you hear race, equity, and education, you think, oh, I know what race is, I know what equity is, I know what education is. And then, you know, but in that context, right, if you don't have a particular perspective, you probably don't understand to the degree that you're going to learn at that conference, right? At the conference, you will hear from people who have spent hours and hours and hours and hours pouring over data, looking at examples, and 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 learning and and absorbing situations, breaking them down to to show you what were those elements and what were those threads that were pulled, that could have been pulled, that should have been pulled, right? To prevent particular situations and I think that it gives you tools for like like I said I know we typically think when you think of race related stuff you think oh it's it's, it's going to be you know white teachers who, but it's not right we all learn I know I do all the time right you know I, I, I tell you I love diversity training not because you know it's 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 not some woe is me oh man like no it's not that right it's like man that's true for instance you know and, and we can go back to I remember when uh remember when that they had the DC sniper? Remember who? And, that joke, Jack Joker's right. And like the people are soccer like the motherfucker. Is it black dude? Yeah, exactly. Like, what the fuck? Are you exactly. kidding? Me? Are you kidding me? Everyone's called like some white dude, yep. some hillbilly, yep. some yep. anti government guy. Yep. And yep. that dude was I mean, this this dude was actually a genius, right? They had to set up the, the back seat of the car and yep. like no one noticed him, but like, man, yeah. Yep. Like, so so him. He would knock him off with that left or right. Yeah, so him. Right, like so, I in diversity training, I remember um, it was called KM training, Kaiser Mark or something. And so they were saying, like they said, you know, they talked about the nature of, um, you know, like Caucasian people typically don't see themselves as sort of the as connected, right? more of the, the rugged individual, mm -hmm. like the old Republican, yeah, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> they were saying, like, when when you see Ted Bundy or somebody like that, you know. You know, according to the training, I don't know that if this side is true, but they say, you know, if white people don't look at them and be like, oh man, look at that man. And, you know, but, you know, you know, you look at him, wow, look at what he did. Mm -hmm. He's horrible. This guy's terrible. He killed me. But when they said, when the DC sniper, we found out the DC sniper was black, they said, black people were like, what? We don't do that. We, yeah. And that's exactly my first thought. I was like, we don't shoot people. We're like that. Like, not just. Did you ever see this? Do you see this kind of Saturday Live where like it like did like Saturday Night get like like a news anchor, right? And it was like the first like, hey, this person committed a crime. It was like, but it was a white guy. The black people like the news anchor, yes. <laughs> and then it's like next crime, uh, Sam Adams committed, you know, financial fraud. That's a white dude. So it came up, fucking African guy, right? 
God damn it, you know. So it came to a competition, like, who's going to get my prime, right? It's so messed like, Come up. on, God, God damn, dude. You know, we don't do that. It's so messed up because, man, every time there's, you know, you know, knock on wood, it's terrible, but like mass shooting and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. It's always a white person. Yeah, it's always. But it's like, that black dude did this? What? You know, and so. And then one time, um, so I, I said to all time, I spent too much time on TikTok, right? Uh-huh. And so these two comedians on that, right? Is a they're 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 doing comedy together, a black guy and a white guy, right? Uh-huh. The black guy, hey, hey, dude, like uh tell me a time like you have white privilege. And the guy said, Yeah. One time I was driving my car with a friend, I was lost, right? And I kind of speed and a cop pulled me over. First I asked was for directions. It's true, right? Yeah, I for directions. I didn't think about getting go to jail. Just hey, uh-huh. thanks for pulling me over. I'm lost. I'm lost. Can you help me out? You know, yeah. and, and that's a that's a sad. My bad speeding, right? Where you know, like getting pulled over black is the real thing, unfortunately, right? Yeah, absolutely. Sad but true. Right? Yeah, and that's we need a conference on that. That's our next conference. Yeah. So for the conference, uh, so me, the conference October first, October third. October 3rd but I actually see it's two parts. The conference, the second and third, all the breakout sessions, the keynote speakers. To me, I think actually the real more important part is the dinner, right? To me, I see the dinner is like more VIP. I hate to say more important people, more important money, right? But like, like, talk about the dinner itself, right? And what you want to achieve with the dinner. So, we're, so we'll have to decide. We'll have to speak to. We'll have to ask Barbara about the the real breakdown for the dinner. But the the who, uh, like, I, like I say, the dinner. Like I see the conference October second is like more like branding. This is what we do. I see the dinner is like, hey, now it's like you know, asking for money. But hey, like we're you're here for a reason, right? You're for the dinner for a reason. It's more private, more personal, more interpersonal. Like we need your money. I might be completely wrong about that. But that's the way I see it. I mean, yeah, we'll have to get the details from from Barbara. But yeah, the the it is the the dinner is more VIP. I don't want to say. It's, it's people who were more selected. Mm-hmm. Um, the you know that's more personal invitation. You yeah. know, like hey, Bob was probably call, they'll probably call people you know your network. Hey, John, Bob, you know, can you come to the dinner? Blah blah blah. Uh, I'll prep her for that question in a okay. couple weeks to give some details on. That. So, um, as a president of the board, what's your like goal for the conference? What do you want to see so, happen? So, couple, first, I want people to come and learn some experts. Sort of the traditional, you know, you go to a conference to learn from a CNC perspective. You know, I want for us as CNC to pull this conference to to show that we, you know, this is this is a this is a skill we have. We want to do this every year. This is something that's worth doing. So we're learning, you know, that this is something worth that we're worth doing. And it's also because you think about a conference gives the opportunity for learning to occur forever, right? Basically, as long as it's recorded and, and, and people are uh, able to watch it. And it shows, you know, one, it gets our name out there, you know, and selfishly, that's always something you want to be even more well-known. I mean, this is national, at least. Um, and, you know, I'd like for us to be able to, you know, to, to, to actually be able to build more connections in the community to, because you know, if, since it's in Seattle, the majority of people will be in this area. Mm-hmm. So you know, build more connections with the community beyond Kent, but also you know, be able to you know to to show that we have the ability to hold a conference that's effective. It's an effective learning opportunity, and people learn, people network, people communicate, and tie back for it. So that as we grow, you know, our supporter base grows as well. So, man, I might ask this already. But why should someone attend this conference? It, it it all depends, right? For the reasons could be the reasons could be if you're a teacher, valuable tool, right? If you're a, if you're a student of racial justice, or if you're a student of equality, or if you work in a diversity um, uh, function at a job, right? The same, even though we say it in education, you could remove education, put you know other words, right? It, it, you know, it could be aerospace. It could be technology. It could be military. It could be anything. So, you know, the why you should attend a conference is to learn and to to be to to see how other people. You know, one of the things I like to do when I go to a conference is, you know, you know how when you when you go and you take notes, 
And then you stop taking notes and you look around to see if other people are taking notes to see if people have taken that same information that you did and identified the same value. And you stop writing first so that they know something you don't know. Uh, conferences give you that opportunity to do that. And like I said, to, let's just be honest, right? To a lot of people, the concepts of the, the, the concepts, at least especially for a lot of corporations, you know, the concept of diversity is scorecards, and scores, and press releases, right? But, you know, when you actually take a look at what are some beliefs that you have that, you know, may make you not as much of an ally or may make you not as much of a, um, you know, a, a real proponent of, of inclusion, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a skill you can, you can bring back with you. Like, you know, look at your own biases. We all have biases. Yeah, everyone does. Everybody. If someone says I'm a bias, like, you're a motherfucking liar. Yeah, everybody. Everyone has a bias. Right? Yeah. And then, you know, and a lot of them, maybe they don't know. Maybe, yeah. you, and you need this conference to help you recognize that you have that bias. So, I know in the pre-talk, I said I would not ask you a gotcha question, <laughs> but is there a speaker, like, you're really looking forward to, like, listening to? I'm, I'm going to still go. I mean, I want to hear I actually want to hear everyone, but like, is yeah, like one, to... like, okay, this person speaks, I'll make sure I'm, I'm in this session. Well, the irony is, but mm -hmm. tell me, buddy. Um, I don't know, all of them, right? I want to hear, so I ordered the book Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome mm -hmm. by Dr. Vigil. Yeah. And as I talked to the lady who I mentioned before, like, her energy was so extreme. Like, I got to see her. She was like, these are the pillars. Bam, bam. And I was like, man, all right, let me get this book. So I can read it, and um, so I want to hear her. I want to okay. hear. I want to, and, and like I said, it's you know when 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 you look at people, you know. I only recently, I'm sure you're probably the same. Really gotten into like mental health, yeah, and trauma, right? And you know, there's that part of me that says trauma is everywhere. Right. And then there's a part of me that says you have to be able to ignore a lot of trauma, even though you shouldn't, but you have to be able to ignore it. Well, I like to like hearing about the trauma, the potential trauma that I may have been overlooked, especially as a black man in America. Right. Like for me, you know, it's like, you know, there there's a lot of trauma that things that I've just accepted. I don't even think about it anymore. Right. Now, is that right or wrong? Well, does it probably probably helps me to not recognize I mean, perfect example of that, like, like Sir Kill O'Neill, right? He was raised in a military family, stepdad's military. And he's telling the story how his dad treated him. And like, people were like, Shaq, you were fucking abused. Yeah. And they second, like, no, I was. I was like raised by a loving father who loved me yeah. and had my best interest. I'm like, dude, the people were like, Shaq, he abused the fuck out of you, right? Yeah. Fun fact, I actually worked for stepdad when I was down at, uh, oh, did you? San Antonio. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, it was just for a little bit. But, um, no, but yeah, you're right, like that, right? And like, if you think about, so we so we talk about equity, right? You know, people are like, what the hell is equity? Yeah. That concept of equity, I think, is what underlies. Like, like you you think about it, one of my one of the things I'm most proud of is I recognize my ancestors were enslaved Africans. My ancestors were slaves. I'm proud of that fact because I know that what I do in my life, I'm paying homage. Five cent word to to them, right? Yeah. Think about how fucked up that is, though. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you, you think about like people were actually enslaved in this country. You know what I mean? And, yeah. I mean, it's so common to us. Like, Not too long ago. Yeah. Like people don't realize Jim Crow was hundred years ago, right? Exactly. Exactly. Right. And you think about the 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 acceptance of that as part of American history, and how much that plays to things like policing and, and mm -hmm. you know driving while black these are all just things that you know you you talk i thought i saw this uh i'm sure you've seen it too that TikTok where the guy's like hey before my son leaves every day i tell him hey look, yeah. you're pulled over by please don't. like you, know, you got to teach your kids something different to deal yeah, with the people who your up. fucking tax yeah. dollars are paying like this is what this is what i think these types of conferences mm -hmm. bring to you and it's something for everybody right? it's not just so not, this to our subject kind of fucked it right. Like sometimes my mind operates differently. And so this, this guy has a TikTok, right? He's a black guy. He's an E6 Army. He like different TikToks, right? And his wife, white, his wife is white. They have a like biracial son, right? Mm -hmm. And so they did a, a TikTok, right? Where like a, a father said, 
my son's biracial. Of course, he doesn't use like a lotion, right? right. The son's like, my daddy's black. Of course, he knows how to cook fried chicken, eat watermelon. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, you know, as a joke, it's funny. It's like, you like, the dad's like, dude, you can't say that, man. That's fucking racist as fuck, right? But it's true, dad. I don't get fuck. It's true. It's fucking racist. Yeah, it's and it right. goes a whole like five minutes feel like it's the funniest shit, right? And, 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 but see, like, stuff like that, right? Like, that's a good skit. But like you, but like you look at some real things, right? Mm-hmm. Like you look at how people interact, right? <clears throat> how people, like, like, like how people, you know, can't be comfortable. Yeah. You know, me and you would go out. You know, there's, you know, obviously, you know, everything, but you know, as we go places, mm-hmm. you know, you you start seeing, you could see some of the differences, and you know, most of the time, like, sometimes positive. And positive. thing is, you don't know people's backgrounds. Like I know, yeah. I know a lot of black people who are like, you know, at Three years old, that's my white family, and they're only and they're like part of white family, you know. So it's different, you know. I know like white people grew up in black neighborhoods, right? Yeah. It's like it's all about culture, I think, you know. And basically, like, like you say, you're you're either a good person or not, right? And that's exactly right, right. But just like when you have a a school shooting, oh my god, he was abused and he was this, oh he yeah. was, you know, he was oh he's he's a lone wolf and he yeah. So we're gonna talk about mental health real fast, right? Um, just quickly, so. One thing, like a lot of the current generations, like Z, A, what the fuck it's called. One thing I like about them, they're like really good on mental health, right? They're like, mental health days was a good thing. Like, we're not we really growing up. You're depressed? Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, what is that? You're depressed, you're fired, right? You know, like, especially yeah. military, right? Yeah. Now, on the other hand, right, you can't take a mental health day every fucking day, right? Yeah. Like, there's some goodness to like being resilient and, you know, going through like fucking um, obstacles and stuff, right? And so this, I think, is a balance for that, right? Like, you're like, Monday how days, yes, but man, uh, you can't expect a victory every time, right? I think a lot of this generation, like, they're missing out on the obstacles resiliency, right? Yeah. And, it, and it's funny because I always, I always think about, like, who's fucked up after them, right? You know what I mean? And because, and I don't mean, like, from a mental health perspective, obviously. I've definitely been yeah. depression. But would it be us who's fucked up? Because, you, like, you... You know, they got that book, the DSM four that shows like you can look you look at what it was in the eighties or whatever or nineties or whatever and then how it's how it grows, right? As, as more and more things are added. And I'm like, that means we suffered from that, right? Like I knew people who were depressed, but oh, if you're depressed, you're a punk or you're whatever. Right? It was one for you. I saw this somewhere, right? Where like uh you know our generation drink out the water hose, that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. right? And like this uh there's a parent telling the kid, Hey, when I was growing up I did this or that and the kid's like what? Grandma's a fucked up person. Like your <laughs> grandma did that to you? Yeah. Like you were abused, dad. Like no wonder you're so jacked up. Exactly. I, I, I thought grandma was a good person. She like kicked out of the house and made you took a water hose and like don't do this. Like, damn, dad, you 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 fucked up growing <laughs> up. Thank you for not making me do the same thing, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, you gotta look at <clears throat> you know what I like to look at, and this is actually something like study one day. You hear that concept of first world problems, mm-hmm. right? So the, I was like, the, the flavor of water. Yeah, the flavor of water. What would, what would happen if you looked at the state of our mental health, and if you took a baseline here, if you took a baseline in another country, that's you know maybe not as developed, you know, third world, mm-hmm. and look at levels of depression, mm-hmm. look at levels of X, Y, and Z, mm-hmm. and see what is the impact on circumstance, but also expectation. Yeah. I would really like to do a deep dive on that. Well, by I mean, 50 cents of the time, depression is a first world problem. Yeah. I mean, to, to and, yeah, another thing people say, like, if, if someone's going to kill themselves, throw them in the middle of the ocean. They merely want to survive. <laughs> well, drowning would suck. Yeah. They merely want to survive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't want to die. Like, I want to die on my own hand, like, not this random shit, you know? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um. So, talk some about the vendor and sponsor opportunities for the conference. So, yeah. So, you know, starting with sponsorship. I'll oh, start with vendors. Vendors. So yeah, there's some, there's a lot of opportunities for vendors. So if anyone has um, not a non-food product, or <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> remember that conversation. Anyway, a non-food product or or a service that could be represented. Um, yeah, reach out. And, you know, there's a vendor opportunity. It's very inexpensive. Um, and for sponsorship, you know, looking for sponsors uh, for the organization, you know, we'll provide some recognition for you or your company, however you want to uh, 
you know, however the, the, the sponsorship is. is a step. And, and for the vendor, like, it's like, I, I hate to say cheap, it's $150 for two days. Yeah. That's, that's fucking cheap, Super right? Cheap. But they, they're like, what do y'all provide? Like, like, do you, do you have to bring the own table? Do you provide on a table a space? Like, you provide electricity? Like, how's that work? We have tables, and for sure. Mm -hmm. And I would assume we have electricity. I okay. Can, I can confirm that, but I, I know that. And you're a vendor, right? Is it like, are you going to be in the same room as a conference? You're going to be outside the conference? Like, have you decided like what spaces they have? The conference will go over multiple rooms, mm -hmm. but there's a there's a, a a big looks like a banquet hall mm -hmm. that's outside of all of the rooms, mm -hmm. and where the vendors will be. It's a large room, okay, and uh, big. They can hold lots of tables. And I know you have like different pricing models for the <laughs> for the um, sponsor, right? But it's a pricing model where I told someone like. I think the top one is like twenty five thousand dollars. I can't remember what it is. It's called, but I pay like someone pays twenty five thousand dollars. They get to speak to everyone for ten minutes. Like, what do they actually get? So it's funny you should ask that. We're, you know, we're still developing. The, we know when our speakers and we know what our workshops are. Mm -hmm. We have those moments that's in between. Mm -hmm. And honestly, we're waiting to see if we get a twenty five thousand mm dollars -hmm. sponsor. And I'm sure that I'm sure I will. Make, yeah, I'm sure that can, that'll work, and um, we can make that work. So a conference I went to on Thursday, a curriculum forum, right? I think they did a good job, like us, like balancing pitches with sponsors, right? They were someone do a pitch that says, "Hey, I want to introduce, you know, Tom Brown from ABC Towing as a preferred partner." They get, give the five minute spiel, right? So I think they did a good balance. They did a good balance, like balancing like speakers, pitches, sponsors, vendors. I think they did a great job with that, right? But yeah, that's a good model. I mean, because like. I mean, this, I mean, you get a sponsor to get in front of people. Like, they, that's, that's the thing that's far right. And that's a good thing, right? And of course, I'm guessing I need, like, you know, educational sponsors, you know, people involved with ed, ed tech, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, in, in, in related industries. Yeah, well, yeah. And, like, right? you get some kind of, like, you know, ed tech startup, you know, like, making big money. That's first. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't say. Well, I mean, that's great. Yeah. But also, you know, we have, there's there's a diversity element there. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, and there's so many, like, people don't realize, there's so many, like, ed tech startups, diversity tech startups, you know. A lot of that, right? So next, talk about, uh, I know you're talking about these speakers when they speak and someone gives like quote unquote class, there's some kind of certification hours or coaching hours. Can you talk about that? There are, yeah. There are some, you know, CEUs. Uh, for, what does CEU stand for? Well, well, well let me, uh, credit, equivalency, credit equivalency unit? That sounds right, yeah. yeah. We'll go with that. You might be wrong as fuck. But oh, all right, that. all right. I've, I've got them. I've got plenty. I don't read the small print. <laughs> I got. I think it's credit equivalency units or something. Now I gotta look it up. No, I now I gotta look it up. Thanks a lot for it. Um, but no. So our plan, and it's very very close, is to have to provide the ability for to to receive CEUs for attending the conference. And and these come from like different colleges, different organizations. I don't want to say the name, but it's a big, 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 big college in the area. Okay. Right? And, okay. you know, we'll put it out. And that will be in our marketing materials once we finalize and all the ink is dry. But it's the, it's probably the, the biggest. And if you look at my LinkedIn, my alma mater, no. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, no. But yeah, it's good. Um, talk about the networking opportunities available to people for the conference. Yeah, I mean, and that's, so I, I think a lot of times, if, if you have people who are in an education that's easy, right? You meet other people you work with, you meet people at other schools, you meet people. Like I've, you know, as I've, I've kind of perused some of the people who've registered so far, and you know, they're from all over this area, from as far as uh, uh, Edmonds, not Edmonds, yeah, Edmonds, yeah. And Edmonds, and all the way down to Olympia. So, you know, that that's this area, well, and, and some from outside of this area, but. You know, you get the opportunity to talk to some of your peers, but also you get to talk to people who are in other industries that are touching, you know, the race, equity, and, the, and diversity um, <clears throat> field, right? So, you know, you, you know, you'll meet teachers, you can meet speakers, you can meet people who are business people, mm -hmm. people who work at big companies, but everybody has sort of that underlying passion for uh, diversity and inclusion. And it might be an opportunity to find a better job. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you know? absolutely, absolutely. Hey, we want to get some vendors who are actually recruiting as well. So, for the dinner, talk about the restaurant y'all hiring, right? <laughs> like, 
<laughs> that's a really good food there. Yeah, it is. It is. Oh, I don't want to say the name, but you know what it is. And it's. Uh, I mean, you can say the name. Oh, all right. Well, yeah. so Chase the Caribbean. Yeah. Right? And man, do I, I know you're a big fan of the oxtails, the chicken wings. It's called it's jerk. It's a jerk jerk chicken wings, yeah, though, right? Jerk chicken wings to the oxtails, the, the plantain. I love all of them. Where are they located at in Seattle? Uh, it's right there on Cherry Street. Like if you get off. Uh, you get off the Cherry Street exit. You drive over the hill. Uh, okay. I don't even know. I live in Kent, so I don't really know Seattle. You know how to get there. I know how to get there. Yeah, just follow your stomach. But it's so <laughs> good, so good. Now. Yeah. I've had their catering several times. Yeah. So delicious. And then for the Africa's conference, you have, of course, I have food there too. Who's like doing the food for the conference? The so. That's a barbecue. Right? Barbecue. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. So next. So. I've been involved in the tech startups since like a long time, right? And this is my opinion, right? Every talk about diversity in tech, all the kind of stuff. But if you look at the stats, nothing has improved, right? Like people get hired as diversity people, get six figure salaries. Everyone talks about it. But if you look at the stats, none of the stats have improved, right? The stats are the same for the last 10 years. Even with the, like the <clears throat> emphasis on tech, diversity, inclusion, like why do you think the stats have not improved? I mean, I think there's a lot of different factors, right? And I think a lot of those factors are tied to things like there are, one, right? If, if you have a community that doesn't have, let's say, black people right? in tech, <clears throat> if I don't have black people in tech uh, in a community, then I don't really have a lot of black people pulling people in, from the community into tech. Right, like if you go to some other country, so you go to India, right? In India, there's a lot of tech presence, so their communities are aligned to moving that way, right? That is a, is a viable um, path that you see all the time, right? Like I think about in the Midwest. Remember, like when the car dealer, the uh, Ford, Ford and, and Chevy, and like those big car dealers. Everybody said, when I graduate from high school, I'm gonna go work at the plant, right? That that sort of illustrates what I mean, sort of the, the draw of having that community presence of an industry and how that pulls people into, and it's always, it's, you know, here it was Boeing before, and then, you know, you know uh, when I graduate high school, I'm gonna go work at Boeing. Um, and then, you know, it, there's always something like that, but tech as an industry, right, is, <clears throat> you know, it's, 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 if you don't have a large amount of people in an industry, you can't, expect a larger people to enter, a large amount of people to enter into an industry. My daughter and her friends, I talk to them all the time about tech. So I'm sure that at least one or one or more of them will be influenced to enter tech because they know somebody in it, they've seen it. I mean, like, take a job like air traffic controller, right? Who the hell, you ever heard of an air traffic controller if you don't, you know, if you don't know an air traffic controller, but if you do know an air traffic controller, you'll find that they pull people into that industry. That, and I think that that's one, and sponsorship, right? So part of diversity efforts, right, have to be nurturing the pipeline. You have to be able to go into the schools and show, like I said, once again, we need to take, pick, you know, pick a group of a, a, a school and sponsor them from one of these big tech firms and you know, give those kids the latest and greatest gadgets and pique their curiosity, pique their interest, and then nurture that them throughout and you'll see that after a while they'll go back and they'll nurture or their kids will nurture and you you're, you're basically feeding your pipe so anything else you want to talk about the conference or cnc for move on some other stuff um i mean no, i just say you know if anybody has any information or excuse me any questions on the conference just reach out and uh, i'll be happy to answer them okay cool so next thing like this is my pet peeve right with the diversity stuff right I'm just throwing these companies out there. I might be wrong, completely wrong. But I remember, like, it was like four or five years ago where the uh, the person in charge of diversity for Apple, right? Like, he was there for three years. The diversity task actually went fucking down, right? They got fucking worse. And you got a higher paying job at Google. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, you failed at your job. Of course, there's a white dude. I think it was a white person, right? Mm -hmm. white, I can't remember a white dude or white girl, white female. And they still get paid higher to go to Google from Apple, but that's. that's decrease like how does this work right i don't know hey call me if you want to if you want to hire me to be one of those big leaders now um I, you know i think it's you know it's hard to do something when you have 
<clears throat> scores and, and, and quotas. Of course, there's a lot of circumstances and different things yeah. going on, right? Like, how do you score this? You know, yeah, I mean. Yeah, if you, you know, if you have to hire more black people and you hire more black janitors, did you really help them? You know what I mean? No, like, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like, and that's, like, you, like you hired one minority in marketing. Yeah, exactly. But then you had another white person, another black, another minority, like, you know, software development, and they would talk to each other. Yeah, like, that's, that's why my big interest is more inclusion. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I think <clears throat> I think if you have if if you make the system equal fair, I like equity as well, because there are a lot a lot of people are, you know, just take a look at, like I said, schools in the area. Mm -hmm. You know, go to a rich school in this area and go to a school that's mm -hmm. not rich in this area and then figure out what those differences are, right? And to make those, you know, kind of making those, yeah, sure, if you if you give to both those schools ten dollars. You know, that's kind of quality from that standpoint. But if you make this school as good as this school, that's equity, right? Yeah. And I think that equity and inclusion are what we need in this country in order to really get things the way it's supposed to be. So what is diversity, right? Because this is my point of view. I think so, so many people, I like, think diversity is like based on race, color, right? Yeah. Like diversity is so many things. Like diversity, everyone, it, it includes people like me. Yeah, absolutely. Like people who are blind, people absolutely. crippled. Like I think so many people like, don't get me wrong. Like if you're like, I don't know, blank group, right? You're pro this blank group. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Like for this, you're, you're, you're like pro blind people, right? That's yeah. fine. But are you really diverse if you're only focused on blind people, right? I mean, yeah. Well, I think that you, whenever, <clears throat> if you think about, once again, you go back to kind of the, the, the concept of fairness, the concept of equality, mm. right? There's always, this is what it looks like. Let's say we go a hair color. Mm. This is what it looks like, right? Mm -hmm. Mine right here, probably down here at the bottom. Right? So, you know, if, if you have a program that says, hey, we want to get this to here, or, you know, if you go at race and you say, okay, we have a, you know, we have it like this, right? If you look at the number of CEOs, you look at the number of, you know, senior managers, you look at the number of everything, right? It goes like this. Well, if you recognize that there's a dip here and there, the number of, or the quality of, or the pay of, or the whatever of, or the whatever of, you will still, you will see that there's a need to drive a change. So that's why you see groups that focus specifically on this element, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Of course. No, there's nothing wrong yeah. with it. I mean, it, it should have corporate sponsorship, including like, and, and I think diversity, right, is often seen as an attack, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, or you're taking is. something away from yeah. me, or, but it's not, you know. So it, this is going to sound fucked up, right? So here's a group of people who I think get fucking shit on all the time, mm -hmm. but there's not really support them, right? I mean, I think there's a real, this kind of, I said this kind of something messed up, but there's a real bias against short people and ugly people, right? <laughs> I mean, think yeah. about it. Like, no one, like, if you're hiring someone, they're, like, decent looking and ugly. I mean, it's kind of messed up, right? It, it, it's true, right? I mean, if the stats show, you know, the better someone looks, the more likely they get hired. True. The shorter someone is, more likely they get not hired, right? True. I mean, it's unfortunate, but it's the truth, right? Yeah, no, that's true, right? That's very true, I, I think. That's what the I mean, data it's kind of funny, you know, the data suggests, yeah. right? You know, yeah. like, I mean... What's his name? Kevin Hart is like five two. He's one of one of the most successful four people in the history of the world, right? True, but he's not that. No, yeah, true. But yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's interesting. I never actually thought. I wonder if there's support groups. I'm sure there is. <laughs> there, there are diversity. So, groups. most corporates have something called I think it's called employee support group ERG, something like that. What is what is that? Employee resource group. Yeah, the employee resource. Group. They're, they're typically you know groups that are focused on um, representing and sort of. Accelerating and uplifting, whichever group, you know, veteran, black, Asian, you know, whoever it may be, you know, there's <clears throat> these groups are all about representing the the experience of those you know employees who are members. And like I said, it's how I think of it is my stupid phrase I just threw out a minute ago. If things are great for everyone, things are great for everyone. Mm -hmm. Like if. You know, I'm sure you've heard that oh, the 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 <clears throat> factoid that's thrown around that the number one benefit, their number one group that benefits from affirmative action was white women. Right? Like, and it's not even fucking close. Uh, you know, that's not even close. Exactly. Right? 
but that's but those rules help everyone. Okay? And in that instance, I'm not sure how it worked out. But I mean, because they were smart enough to take advantage of the system. But if but if you look at efforts to make things better for any person, that's why I join any ERG. Because if you if you're able to affect change that's written into policy for any group or any person, right? Then it benefits all. Yeah. Right? And it's crazy how people don't realize that, right? They're like, oh, this ERG group from veterans, that's taken away from my success as a, you know, whatever, you know. Yeah. yeah and that's, and, and, but a lot of it is designed, you know, back to comparison. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, people joy. I lose. There's a finite amount of good news. There's a finite amount. Yeah, the pie. I want to climb. People think the pie is small. The pie yeah. is big as whatever, it is. you know. And it, and it grows, gets bigger. It grows the more you bring people in, right? And, and that's that's why I think diversity, I, I, you know, in many cases, I think it is rolled out, mm -hmm. right? Because it's exclusionary. The policy itself is exclusionary for white men, typically. That's the group, the, the number one example. But I mean, the thing is, like, you know, there's all these groups, right? Like over 40, whatever. It's like, man, if you're a white dude, 35 years old, you're kind of fucked, you know? Yeah, yeah there's nowhere for it. Like, like, damn, dude. Like, I, I grew up in a, like, a middle, like a low income home, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah. But people don't understand that, you know, there's the, the opportunities, right, mm -hmm. around creating a, an environment where everybody can be their best. Yeah, that's the, it gives people opportunities to be their best. Yeah, that's all that matters. Yeah. Inclusion. If you have an opportunity to really come in and do what you need to do, an environment that supports you, guess what? If you want to, if 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 the rules are established, we can really start looking at the meritocracy. Or we yeah. can start looking at the harder I work versus, hey man, you know what? I I work my ass off, but you know, John John dips snuff or climbs yeah. mountains and shit. You know, like or you there's a it. case in a in a Alabama a while ago, right, where it's a car wash. This black guy who's like a like low level employee, and he trained eight white dudes, right? Mm -hmm. And like all of them became manager, but he's still a fucking like a lowly car wash, right? He sued, won like three point seven million dollars, right? But that shit still happens, right? Like, damn, dude, like right. you train these people, and like if you train them, you should be a manager yourself, right? Absolutely. I mean, like as we said, like preference and bias is real. Yeah. Right? Like you can't help it. You know, and, and and but you have to be able to recognize and take it out of your, and like I said, the, the way that you, you do it from a, a, a data standpoint is you give standards and you give quotas and you give this and that. And, you know, while that's, you know, that's a, 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 an attempt, mm -hmm. it rolled out wrong, you know, and, and it can cause more disruption. Yeah. You know. So here's one for you. So you, you're a big fan of Canada, right? Oh. And so this happened a long time ago, right? So... It was like the award was like most diverse HR company in Canada, right? And of course, Canada, I guess like 10,000 percent white, you know? And so of course, everyone there was white. Mm -hmm. And some some black people from America like just clap back like, this ain't diverse, blah, blah, blah. This is bullshit, you know? And this white person from the Canada, Canada was like, like, true, I agree, we're not like diverse, like diverse by color, but three of us are immigrants, two of us are LGBTQ, two of us are like military, like, you know, handicapped. So it broke down like 10 reasons are diverse. Like, damn, that's fucking, that's crazy, you know? You know, and that's, <clears throat> I mean, I think there's, there definitely are diversity, the, the concept of diversity, like I said, is so heavily aimed at race. Yeah. That's why I said I like the word inclusion. Yeah. <clears throat> like, I, I, I'm a, to my point of view, you give me 10 people, right? I can, I can convince you why they're all like the same. I gonna see if I all Tim look all like diverse, right? You could take two twins. Yeah, exactly. And you could say they're diverse. Yeah. Right? You can have a triplets, quadruplets, whatever. I mean, I know people hate to say a lot of people like have a negative thing about like diversity of thought, but to me it's a real thing, right? People think differently, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you see that. Like there's a lot of exercise that's actually used um in, in reference to racial diversity, but it shows diversity of thought, right? Mm -hmm. You from one place, I'm from another. Yeah. It it greatly um, you know, varies how we think varies great, mm. right? Based off of where we're from, what we've experienced. You know, I you know I see some see some people who, you know, they they think in a way that I say, 
it's not it's not efficient at all. No. And then those same people look at me like being careless, you know, or something yeah. to that effect, right? For example. And you know, and you need us both. You put us both together and you end up with something in decent time. Yeah. Can, yeah. I'm like, working with this a few years ago, the example is like these they actually it's like these these three black men, they're triplets, right? Mm -hmm. They graduated from Howard University as a doctor, right? So think of like what a what a great example of the person like, but they're triplets. Yeah. From Howard. The black black, how's it diverse, right? But I'm sure, like you said, the diverse are like different things, right? They're probably different, like thought processes, different things, you know. And and you you think about, you know, a friend of mine. We always talk, and he compares like, if 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 a person is African American, do we think the same as a person who's first generation from Africa? Yeah. You know, and I mean that's a big thing. So my son lost from Kenya, right? Mm -hmm. He talked all the time how like. The philosophy of people from Africa versus people in America are so fucking different. Like he's like, us from Africa, we see opportunity, we see goals, we see we can make it here, we have a better life. But the he like he said like the brothers born here, they're like fuck America, like what I'm, I'm the man's against me. And we're like no. Yeah, I mean it's it's a different drive. That's, yeah, definitely you know, different, different people, drive. People change from a stimulus, right? There's always yeah. a stimulus that drives. And what's the thing like, like immigrants, first generation immigrants, are like all like all in, right? Fourth generation, like not so much. <laughs> I'm good. My parents did, but because my parents did this, so I don't have. To. Yeah, I'm American now. Yeah, it's it's funny. Yeah, you know, but also you look at if you take <clears throat> if you took two twins, black men, mm -hmm. and you put one of them in highly affluent area and one of them in a not affluent area, those two twins are gonna. I mean, environment's gonna shape. Them. Yeah. So so. By that rationale, the twin from the affluent area would probably think very similar to the people around him, yeah. regardless of their race. Yeah. Right? And the, the other the same with the other. What's that thing? Like two sons or two daughters, their father or mother's alcoholic. The one guy's like, I'm a alcoholic because my father was. Other guys, I'm not alcoholic because my father was. Touch it. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Right? That's true. And that's in the environment. And Know how they experience what you know the alcoholism or how you experience racism, right? So let's suppose there's a college student out there, a young person, whatever, and like they're really really interested in a program manager. What advice do you have them as far as a career advice? Learn how to get people to work together. Learn how to track stuff. Learn how to keep records. Learn how to you know deal with situations when people are not happy that you're you know you're asking them for potential you know conflict resolution. Um, Learn how to support people, you know, learn how to, you know, one of the biggest skills is learn how to get something started and hand it off. You know, I, I always say, for me, it's like, if, if <clears throat> you know, just the, the dynamics of people, right? If you want someone to do something and it's something they weren't expecting to do, okay, if you have, because if you want them to do it, you have more information than they can take. So get something started, put it over to them to finish. And that, I think that always makes people way more open to, you know, Acting fast and reflective. So, Aubrey, is there anything else I should ask you that I didn't? Or anything else you want to talk about? Don't ask me where I hang out. <laughs> no, I'm joking. No, I think that's good, man. I appreciate it. Cool. Um, appreciate you having me. So, how can people reach out to you about what, what, like, personal stuff, like your party management stuff, program management stuff, or like CNC? Uh, you reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, my name is Aubrey Shinhoster. I'm sure it'll be written on there. Or you can reach out to me. Um, at Asian Hoster, like my last name, at gmail.com. And uh, you're happy to answer any questions. All right. So you get a lot of good value, a lot of good advice. But last thing, can you give us any wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Well, you know, I just, <clears throat> you know, one of, one of my things, man. You know, it's a, you know, it's a, a sort of a seeing, a, seeing people against people for dumb shit like what you see on social media and stuff like that. Like, I wish we could bring that, get that out of here. I think that that's so disruptive. Our friendships have been lost, families. And I'm not even talking about just the politics. I'm talking about people who, two people arguing over a fact that's not right. Like, take the time, work together, figure out what's really going on. Not, you know, bring, let's bring down the, the aggravation. Isn't it crazy how people argue about it and like they're both wrong? Yeah, you're both wrong. 
like one time, like in the, when I was in the army one time, there was two people that like worked in my same section, right? It was crazy. Like they're both like fucking Dutch, right? And one person talking about another person, like the person fucked up. The other person talking about you're fucked up. Like I'm thinking to myself, what the fuck? Like you're both fucking like horrible people. Like you're both at your job. Like this is insane. Exactly. But they would, they would die on that hill. What they say? Oh yeah. Love that saying. Die on that. Hill. Oh, yeah. Hey Aubrey, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. Hey, thanks a lot, Jason. Man, appreciate it. appreciate yeah. this delicious. Dude. Yes. Bumboo. And so, listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.